city meeting uh tonight uh we have a few things on the agenda so it'll be a very interesting agenda tonight and we'll start off tonight with the pledge of allegiance led by councillor hilliard you'll put your hand on your heart please and say i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic for which it stands one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all thank you thank you uh next up i think it slipped off here uh is a our covid uh moment from those who have passed and that's led by councillor brooks Thank you, Mayor. Um, to date, worldwide, we've lost 3,110,397 people to COVID worldwide, according to the World Health Organization. Um, there's been 572,000 deaths in the United States, and we've had 2,497 here in Oregon, which um, Oregon has been doing fairly well, but that doesn't, there's still a lot of loss for all of us from this illness. So please join me. Also, I just wanna say one thing too, even if you've been vaccinated, please wear a mask, wash your hands and watch your distance as the variants are tricky. And if you've been exposed to COVID and have not been fully vaccinated, which means that you haven't received, if it's a two shot, two shots and 14 days, um, you should quarantine for 14 days if you've been exposed. We're seeing an increase in cases and hospitalizations are getting tricky for a lot of areas in our state. Um, so please join me in a moment of silence for those who we've lost and those suffering as a result of COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Council Brooks. Uh, as I mentioned in work session uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Governor Brown called an emergency Zoom meeting of the state's mayors to have a discussion about COVID. Uh, we are seeing a fourth surge of COVID here in Oregon. Uh, they're anticipating that it will probably take two to three weeks to pass. And what's the criticality here is hospital capacity in the Portland metro area. As of yesterday, there were 291 people hospitalized. 66 of those are in ICU. 33 of those are on a vent, and there's a handful of folks going through ECMO treatments, which is basically where they take all your blood out, oxygenate it, and put it back into you. Only Portland area hospitals can do that, and that's why this is a statewide issue, because if you need that treatment, you have to come to Portland for it. Staffing levels at Portland area hospitals are at critical mass. The staff is burnt out and they're, exist, they're experiencing uh, staffing shortages at all the hospitals in the Portland metro area. The governor will be making an announcement tomorrow in terms of what changes she may be making. Um, 11 counties, I think she said, a bunch of counties are gonna go to extreme risk tomorrow. And that's gonna impact uh, restaurants, could possibly rec impact gyms, can impact um, movie theaters. A question was asked about, aren't family gatherings the culprits versus restaurants? And OHA's response was, it's not um, the place that this is occurring. It's the fact that you, the activity, when you take your mask off in close proximity indoors for an hour and a half to two hours, that's how COVID is spreading. So I just wanna let people know, uh, most of the restaurant owners I talked to already are aware of tomorrow and a decision, uh, we don't know, she would not elaborate <laughs> on what they're doing. They were crunching the numbers over the weekend and today 
to decide on what they will do. i don't know if it's gonna be closures, twenty five percent capacity, but we'll find out. but it will be county by county, it sounds like that those counties that are in extreme risk might have a change tomorrow as far as covid restrictions. and as as ah councillor brooks said even if you're vaccinated, you still need to wear a mask that's the biggest thing they're trying to get through to people is one, get vaccinated to continue to wear your mask and then as councillor brooks said also continue to wash your hands and keep socially distant um p i know people are getting tired of this this is getting old but this fourth surge is is upon us and she's hoping to pass this quickly and she can relieve any restrictions she imposes tomorrow within that time frame all right <laughs> sorry to be the bearer of bad news uh moving on to item number two is our is our uh, item number one i'm sorry as an announcement is a proclamation declaring the week of may 2nd through may 8th 2021 as public service recognition week a much happier subject stacy you're on sure um so <clears throat> each year at the beginning of may the city of Tualatin honors our employees during um, what's known as national public employees recognition week uh, to recognize the variety of work that our employees perform um, our approximately 195 employees truly are public servants who tirelessly serve our community. And in this past year, as we all know, <laughs> city of employees, uh, our city of Tualatin employees have stepped up in ways that um, have truly impacted the betterment of our community and probably the most challenging environment of our lifetime. Uh, and whether that was as a, a police officer working in the library, our court systems, uh, our public work staff who you know, help to keep our streets and our environment safe and clean, or for those folks that are working kind of behind the scenes, either in finance, maintenance, IS, or any other internal service. Um, and we know that our employees uh, can be counted upon to show up and act with heart and in a professional manner, which has a lasting positive impacts on our community. And for that, we choose to recognize our employees for their dedicated service. And so I will turn it over to you, Mayor, or I don't know which council member might be reading the proclamation, but that can turn it over. Thank you. And I'm turning it over to Council President Grimes. She's reading the proclamation. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very proud to read this proclamation. And as Stacy mentioned, through the entire last year, um, in the most extreme and absolutely unprecedented circumstances, our city, um, our city employees, our management team, um, the volunteer teams that the city manages have absolutely stepped up to the plate and produced a better outcome, I think, than any of us ever could have imagined. Um, whether it was dealing with COVID and the changes we had to make um, to continue to give services, whether it was cleaning up after a catastrophic ice storm, um, our city and the city employees have just absolutely been there for us and done a tremendous gold star job. And for the people that aren't maybe frontline, but are people in, in finance and all of the other uh, business departments that keep the city's business community going, um, the way that we manage the money, money and the city budget, it, it's just absolutely an enormous source of pride for myself. And I'm sure I speak for the other counselors when I say how pleased and proud and thrilled we are with the people that work for the city of Tualatin. So it gives me great pleasure to read a proclamation declaring the week of May 2nd to May 8th, 2021 as Public Service Recognition Week in honor of the public employees of the city of Tualatin. Whereas public service is an honorable calling that involves a wide variety of challenging and rewarding professions including providing recreational services, maintaining public safety, improving transportation, protecting our environment, and performing administrative and management activities, which are essential to efficient and effective operation of government. And whereas Tualatin city employees contribute significantly to the quality of life for the Tualatin community with their commitment to excellence, high ethical standards, and diversity of skills, and whereas excellence in the delivery of public service helps keep Tualatin strong, prosperous, and a wonderful place in which to live, work, and play, 
and volunteer. And whereas the commemoration provides an opportunity to express our appreciation for the many contributions public employees make to our daily lives. Now, therefore, it is proclaimed by the Tualatin City Council that the week of May 2nd through May 8th, 2021, be Public Service Recognition Week in the City of Tualatin, and the Council encourages all citizens to recognize the accomplishments and the contributions of public employees. Introduced and adopted this 26th day of April, 2021. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yes. Um, one of the, you know, amongst other feedback that city councilors get, we always hear very, very positive things about our city employees. They're very well respected. Um, they go above and beyond. Um, they respond to people on the street, to residents via email. I have the highest esteem for our uh, folks, uh, everyone from finance folks to the police to um, public works uh, folks, especially, you know, you, you showed what you had during the ice storm, how we rapidly responded and uh, did the cleanup. You know, you, you couldn't ask for more from our city employees. And I just want to thank each and every one of you. Um, I always look forward to the breakfast during the holiday time. I get to meet and greet each one of you and fill your place full of bacon and eggs. <laughs> Uh, ideally, hopefully we can do that in December, but we never know. I missed it last year, um, but I'm looking forward to doing it again, hopefully soon. Uh, anyone else have any other comments about our terrific city employees? All right. So moving on to item number two is the state of the city announcement. Is that Megan? Or is it Sherilyn? Who is it? There she is. Um, I'm happy to give the announcement, um, but I'll defer to you, Mayor, if you'd prefer to do it. You can go ahead. All righty. Uh, so Wednesday, May 12th is the State of the City address this year. Uh, we're going virtual, so we're asking everybody to join us at 6 p.m., either via Facebook Live or on Cable Channel 28. There will be a short video, approximately 20 minutes, which many of you participated in, uh, followed by a live Q&A where Mayor Bubinick will be taking questions from the audience. Um, so, um, so while we won't be able to gather in person, we hope you'll see many familiar faces and familiar places. Now I'm looking forward to seeing the final edited product because I think everyone did a terrific job on their tapings. Um, and it should be fun to be able to do that. I have to, you know, I'm going out to Beaverton to do the Q&A. So, we're, you know, it's high quality video. So it's going to be kind of weird uh, to be in a TV studio during the state of the city versus doing it in person. <laughs> But I look forward to it on May 12th from 6 to 7. And I really want to thank Megan uh, for a lot, all the effort she's put into this and scripting it and coordinating all the cats to show up where they should be at the right time. You've done a terrific job. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, item number three, a statement condemning anti-Asian -Asian racism. And this is Councilor Saka. Thank you. The Tualatin City Council is shocked and deeply saddened by the violent attacks in Atlanta last month, which took the lives of eight people, including six women of Asian descent. This and other recent incidents come in the context of a broader trend of anti-Asian racism, which has been increasing since the pandemic began. Racism and hatred have no place in Tualatin, the Tualatin City Council supports a diverse, inclusive, and equitable city. We believe it is our responsibility to provide unwavering support to all the people of Tualatin. We strongly condemn anti-Asian racism and violence and stand with our Asian American and Pacific Islander residents. We commit to actively seek to be informed, aware, and engaged with our community read and affirmed this 26th day of April, 2021. Thank you. Um, as much as I'd like to think it, it doesn't happen in, in our city, it does happen. When Councilor Sacco brought this up a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that at the uh, second COVID shot clinic here in Tualatin, I was speaking with an Asian American and she was accosted in Fred Meyer to my shock. And it's, I couldn't believe it happened in the city, but it is happening. 
Um, so, and it shouldn't be, uh, it, it's ridiculous. Um, the, the fear and the misinformation is just, it's nuts to me how, you know, a race is, you know, being singled out. It's, it's just not right. So please refrain from doing that for a better city than that. All right. Uh, so now we're up to, uh, let's see, public comment. Public comment is an opportunity for anyone to address the council regarding an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Please keep your comments to about three minutes. If there's anyone in this good old Zoom meeting who would like to address the council or who is at the poll center, this would be the appropriate time. So we have- Mayor, we don't have anyone at the poll center, but we do have, looks like Veronica Williams has her hand up in the audience right. on Zoom. All right. Ms. Williams, you're up. Thank you, Mayor and uh, City Council. I appreciate this quick opportunity. Um, we began the City Council meeting with um, a moment of silence and recognition of the many people in our community, our state, and around the world who have lost their lives to COVID. As you all know, on the 19th, beginning the 19th of April, um, vaccines were made available to everyone over age 16. And I am specifically requesting that the city council and the city manager um, join me because I will also reach out to the county. I understand that they control where vaccine clinics, special vaccine clinics go in our community. I really think we need to be much more proactive. We still have seniors in our community who have not been vaccinated, perhaps because of fear, perhaps because of transportation challenges, perhaps because they don't have easy access to signing up. All of our students over 16 are now eligible. We should be taking advantage as other counties are of Hodenstein vaccine clinics at Tualatin High School so that our students can easily be vaccinated without trying to sign up for appointments that don't conflict with their school days. We know that young people are more likely to have cases that have no symptoms and thus are more likely to transmit it to other members of their community. I also ask that we start using um, the wonderful mechanism of next door and other communication techniques to tell our residents where they can easily get vaccines especially which um, pharmacies such as Fred Myers, Costco, et cetera, have them and really be helpful in getting our community vaccinated. These are the people we go to the grocery store with, we go to the library, um, we go to the stores, we go to restaurants, we go to the park with, and we really need to get our community vaccinated. I think we would be shocked if we knew how many people have not been vaccinated and really don't know how to begin. Thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, one of the things I'll meant that I mentioned during my uh, summary of the call yesterday is the governor is you know, committed to get more vaccines out. Uh, the mayor's all chimed in about frustration with vaccinations. And, uh, you know, it comes down to, um, you know, comes down to supply shortages right now with J&J. But with J&J's shots uh, being reapproved and coming back in the supply chain, there is a thought that we might move away from the mass shot clinics and move back to the traditional vaccine approach that you go to your doctor or you go to your drugstore, uh, especially with the J&J vaccine, that it doesn't have the refrigeration requirements. Uh, but I'm certainly will take your message to, um, to Chair Harrington uh, she has a standing meeting with all the mayors uh, once or twice a month, and um, I'll bring up the, your request for the county to be, you know, maybe a little more active in setting up uh, clinics like we had here in Schwalton, and if not, um, you know, working actively to uh, get those shots to, you know, the pharmacy and, and doctor's offices that folks can get in there and get their shot. Uh, she is aware, I think. Uh, the stat yesterday was only, it was in a low 25%, 30% of folks who were totally vaccinated in Oregon. Um, and the, the Oregonian had an article about the uh, inequities of the shots being distributed. Um, and that she 
discussed that yesterday also, and the state is uh, making a plan to fix it. But uh, your comments are uh, well, well noted, Veronica. Uh, anyone else? Any other hands up, please? No, no other hands, hands up, Mayor. All right, thank you. So next up is our consent agenda. Our consent agenda are those items that are considered routine. They will be adopted by one motion unless someone on the council would like an item removed and heard separately later tonight. Tonight, the consent agenda consists of item number one, consideration of resolution number 5539-21, authorizing the city manager to execute a grant agreement with the YMCA and appropriating special purpose revenues in the city's general fund during the fiscal year 2020-21 budget. Item number two is consideration of approval of a new liquor license application for Three Mermaids Public House. And finally, item number three, consideration of approval of a change in liquor license application for Buffalo Wild Wings. Would anyone like to have any items removed from consent or heard separately tonight? Councilor Hillier. Uh, yes, I would like to have item number three removed um, from the consent agenda item and discussed separately, please. All right. So I have a motion for the two remaining items. I move to approve the consent agenda with amendment. Second. All right. So I have a motion and a second to approve the revised consent agenda, that being items one and two. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, now my picture's just shifted. Councilor Brooks? Aye. Councilor Sacco? Aye. Councilor Hillier? Aye. Councilor Pratt? Aye. Councilor Reyes? Yes. Councilor President Grimes? Aye. And I vote aye also. All right. Moving on to special reports. Our first special report is from the Borland Free Clinic, and I believe Jordan, there's Jordan. Welcome, Jordan, representing the Borland Free Clinic. Hi, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here uh, to represent the Borland Free Clinic. My name is Jordan. I'm the Director of Development and Communications, and I'm actually joined by my boss, the Executive Director, Sandy Kosick, who is also on the call. Um, and it's uh, a wonderful opportunity for us to share with you and update you on, on the work that we do. And I wanna thank the mayor for the invitation. So I have a very short uh, presentation, if I may share my screen and um, be happy to answer any questions um, thereafter. So we are the Borland Free Clinic. Um, I'm relatively new to Tualatin, so um, maybe you all are aware of things that I uh, don't wanna take for granted. But uh, we exist um, uh, off of Borland Road on the grounds of Rolling Hills Community Church. And I'll get into a little bit more about what we do and our history and um, some facts about our work. Uh, but you see here just our basic tagline, Hope Health Community. Uh, we are open uh, every week, Mondays and Thursdays from 3 to 7 p.m. and the first Tuesday of the month. And this is a new... Um, um, clinic day, uh, which is made possible by the great uh, internal medicine residents of the Providence Health System, uh, which has been gracious enough to staff our clinic on those days so that we can serve the community an extra day a month. Um, the most important word here is free. Uh, everything that we offer our patients uh, is free of charge. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about why that is. So our mission is uh, to bring hope and healing, as you can read here, to vulnerable people in our community as an expression of Christ's love. So by vulnerable, uh, we serve people who um, are below 200% of the poverty line. That's how we define underserved uh, community members. And um, as you can see, our, our, our work is, uh, we are faith-based, um, our clinic, uh, it, we don't. We do not obviously discriminate um, based on religion, uh, but we do see our services as an expression, uh, a, a call to love uh, our neighbor and to love one another and to make the world a better place. Um, um, and just to cite one example of this, um, our our medical director uh, said recently that every time she comes to the medical clinic, right, uh, to serve there, something amazing happens where she recognizes her work as a calling for her. 
And that's really what, you know, we're all about is uh, when you can do something that you love to do while also helping other people, um, you know, we think of that as a special um, um, place to be and a calling. And so that's why we are there. Um, a little bit of history uh, to our clinic, which is relatively short. Um, and again, this predates me, but as I understand it, the, uh, the idea for a clinic was really the result of an effort on behalf of uh, conscientious parishioners and leaders of Rolling Hills uh, to really support another clinic. Maybe you are familiar with Essentials Health Clinic that uh, pre-existed um, over a decade ago. And what happened was uh, the church uh, did a one-time offering to help reopen a clinic in Tigard, uh, was successful in doing that, and really pursued a partnership with Essential Health Clinic. That didn't work out, and shortly thereafter, uh, Essential Health Clinic closed uh, their doors. And as a result of the experience in working with them, um, the same group of people were really passionate about offering a, uh, a clinic on the grounds of Rolling Hills Community Church. And that took many years uh, to plan and to prepare for. We became our, even though we operate uh, out of the church uh, in its basement, we uh, are a separate organization. Uh, we do, uh, we are a 501c3. Um, and our doors didn't open until 2017 when we started offering pre-diabetic uh, education or the diabetes prevention program, which we still offer uh, today. Um, and really just to help people uh, in that situation live healthier lives. Uh, the, the next, next year, we started, started offering primary care, care services, uh, thanks, thanks to our volunteer providers. providers. Um, and it wasn't until the following year that we hired Sandy, our first executive director, and um, many more accomplishments along the way. But to give you some idea, this past year, we established a formal partnership with Legacy uh, Meridian Park uh, to help uh, pay for lab work for our patients. Um, <clears throat> why uh, are we there? What are the needs? that we serve. Um, I mean, everyone knows the complex and expensive nature of the healthcare system, um, which we all navigate in our own way. Uh, and so we saw a need and we are there to provide for those who fall through the quote unquote insurance gap, uh, who do not have insurance or cannot afford um, uh, quality healthcare as a result of their insurance. And we know that this need is out there. Um, I have some old number, I have an old number here, according to the 2010 census, you all probably could offer me more updated um, statistics, um, but I am familiar with more recent studies such as one out of Clackamas County Health Systems Assessment in 2017, and a County Health Needs Assessment in 2019, which was a joint venture of, region, of, of the counties in the region. Um, and it's, it's very clear that people uh, suffer from economic instability uh, in, in our city and in our region, and as a result, and other things that result from that, like lack of housing, um, um, lack of food, food insecurity, and then obviously lack of health care, uh, despite exhibiting chronic illness. Um, so we see ourselves as a safety net below the safety net. We know of government programs, even the Affordable Care Act, are there to help uh, uh, people and children. Um, but we see ourselves as kind of those to be there to catch those who fall through even those systems uh, who still can't afford health care. Um, and we are the only one, um, we are on the border, obviously, of uh, both counties, Clackamas and Washington, but we uh, see ourselves as serving both. And we are the only free clinic uh, that serves Washington County in that way. And one of only two that serves um, in Clackamas County, the other one being in Oregon City. So um, that's where we are and how we meet this need uh, is through um, three main objectives uh, or, or certain programs uh, of ours. Uh, as I mentioned, um, primary care and diabetes prevention. So, you know, we offer checkups uh, for anything that someone might find themselves in a primary care facility to see their regular doctor um, and to mo help monitor patients uh, who need uh, more consistent monitoring for chronic health issues. Uh, the diabetes education program, as we, as I said, uh, we still uh, do. Um, and that is run by certified uh, diabetes coaches who lead people in uh, nutritional and other educational offerings um, so that they can live health, healthier lives. And then we offer a, a number of specialty services. Uh, it, it varies depending upon our access to specialists, um, but we have, for example, a volunteer podiatrists and physical therapists who come through the clinic on occasion. And we also host 
of periodically vision and dental clinics for our patients in those cases thanks to a partnership we have with pacific university we also do other things like write prescriptions you know offer physicals flu and other shots including the vaccine coming up and then as i mentioned the lab work in partnership with legacy we also you know offer patient navigator services try to help people with organ health plan if necessary whatever we can we can really do transportation to um um to to uh or referrals to project access now for special uh specialties care at a cheaper cost and so forth um so at this point uh if sandy if you're there we're gonna have her kind of fill you in a little bit on some things we're looking forward to um she texted me a minute ago not sure if her internet was working well so i'm just gonna wait and see if she chimes in here yeah can you hear me yeah great okay great i'm here we're just um finishing up in clinic so apologize for the background uh noise i'm gonna see if perhaps and get my video on, but if not, maybe I'll just um, talk to you here. So um, yeah, Jordan has, has laid out basically what we've been doing the past um, three years in clinic. We've got some um, great things that are happening as uh, we move forward. There was, I heard the conversation a little while ago about, um, oh, there you go. Hi. Um, about the vaccines, we're really excited that we're going to be uh, receiving some doses of the J and J vaccine from Clackamas County this coming week. Um, we are going to be providing that um, in our clinics during our regular clinic time, um, specifically three to six p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, we are offering those to our patients and those that are vulnerable in the community. Um, we do have limited doses, so we're not um, broadcasting it widely, but certainly um, in the conversation I heard earlier, if you have vulnerable folks out there um, and if you can get them to the clinic between 3 and 6 p.m. on Mondays and Thursdays starting next week, we will certainly provide them with the J&J &J vaccine. Um, and so we're excited about that. We hope we're going to be able to get more doses from um, Clackamas County down the road. Um, so kind of keep us uh, in mind if you have uh, vulnerable people out there that you know that need the vaccine. Um, as far as going forward, we're looking um, at hiring uh, a volunteer coordinator. Volunteers are the lifeblood of our clinic, so we can't operate without them. So we're looking to um, find a person that can help coordinate that program. We're looking to hire a community health worker. Um, we're seeing an increase in our Latino population, and so we're really wanting to find somebody that can do some uh, community outreach and um, help us uh, serve that population better than, uh, than we have been. Um, we're also looking to uh, expand services uh, in the behavioral health area. Um, that again is a service that we're seeing an increasing need. Um, Jordan mentioned the transportation. We're looking at working with uh, Rideshare and coordinating with the, the church upstairs as well to provide some transportation services from the Tiger Tualatin area to the Rolling Hills um, campus. So we also are looking forward to all of you coming to the our annual gala, September 18th. We're going to host it for the first time at the Tualatin Country Club. So um, hopefully a lot of you can participate in that. So I'll turn it back to Jordan. And I'm just going to offer a few more things here, um, beginning with just some just some numbers so you can kind of see our impact. Um, we had a slight hiccup last year when uh, everybody sort of quarantined at the beginning of the pandemic, but things quickly got back to normal. We never closed our doors. Uh, we did transition uh, to a lighter um, um, hourly, uh, and we um, you know transitioned to some telehealth. Um, but this gives you just some idea of the impact we made. Last year, uh, you see some of our demographics here. Sandy mentioned our uh, large Latino Hispanic population. Um, and so we do offer translation services for Spanish uh, specifically. 
Um, but, you know, as you can see here, we served over 300 unique patients last year. Um, and just for, to know, we have over 1,000 in our patient database, uh, which is something we surpassed last year. Um, that Those 300 patients came in for almost 750 visits uh, last year. And we have an internal way in which our providers uh, establish a kind of um, dollar value to the services we provide just for our reference. And that amassed over $50,000 last year in free medical care that we provided. And as Sandy mentioned, um, that was entirely due to uh, our volunteers. There are uh, just a few of us who are on staff and all of us are part-time. And all of our providers, all of our front desk workers, uh, our translators, uh, everyone is our volunteers. Um, and so they offer their time to do all this work. And the number I have here, over 4,000 volunteer hours. Um, if you just take the last 12 months, not the year 2020, that's over 5,000 hours. Um, and then if you, you know, multiply that by independent sectors, volunteer service hour uh, equivalent, that's quite a substantial contribution in kind uh, to the work that we do. And so we are super grateful. This being Volunteer Appreciation Month um, for our, our great workers. Um, so um, I just wanna share a few testimonials so you can just get a sense for the impact we're making. Uh, this is Valerie, who uh, I won't read through the whole quote, quote but um, just really credits uh, the clinic for what she describes in her own words as potentially saving her life for being there uh, when she needed it most. Um, and there's more of the same. You know, Kay here writes, uh, or, or we quote Kay here as saying, you know, just ha having someone there to invest in you. And this is something we take pride in. We don't over schedule our clinic hours as short as they are, because uh, we want to make sure we sit with the patients, that they're heard, that they're seen, that we know them, that we treat them as people, um, not just trying to cure their disease, disease um, whatever that may be. Uh, so that's super important to us. And we are grateful um, for the feedback we get, uh, how much people appreciate it. So I mentioned our vision a minute ago. Here is our vision um, that every person in the South Portland metropolitan area has the blessing of access to quality health care that is respectful and compassionate. Uh, we are not out to change the health care system. That's really not our burden. We don't feel like that is a complicated mess um, that would require a lot more people and expertise. And I'm sure they still would fail. Um, or we've seen that it's very difficult uh, to make inroads. Our mission is to be there for people who need us. Uh, and that is our goal um, and uh, our, our privilege. Um, and then finally, you know, we just wanna make sure that you all are aware of us uh, as because we are a volunteer-based organization, because our clinic again is free, you know, our overhead isn't large, um, but we do uh, um, exist uh, due to our partners, our donors. Um, but if nothing else, please uh, just spread the word. We. Uh, we aren't that old, uh, we haven't been around that long, and we uh, still have work to do to make sure the community um, and the people who need us know that we are there for them. Uh, so uh, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, um, one of us can try to answer uh, them. Otherwise, thank you again for the opportunity. Thanks, Jordan, and thank you, Sandy. Um, the reason I asked Jordan to come was Jordan's very active at Walton Chamber, and he was in my small breakout room one time, and I was mentioning uh, the services that I remembered um, since I was there in 2017 for the ribbon cutting at Rolling Hills, along with uh, Walton Chamber Board President uh, and Susan Nowak, and he told me, "No, we're way beyond just the blood pressure." and diabetes treatment. So I thought it was very important that we hear what they're doing down on Borland Road, uh, what an asset it is for the community and just reinforces the need for us to, con to, uh, to continue to ad advocate for transportation down Borland Road. Work with Washington County and Clackamas County to get that shuttle either via TriMet or Ride Connection or Smart so that folks can easily get to the clinic and get the health uh, their health needs addressed. So with that, uh, questions for uh, Sandy or Jordan? Councilor Sokka. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have lived in Tualatin for many years and I actually have never heard of the clinic. So I was really excited that you're here today um, to share this information. 
Um, I have a few questions, um, and I'll sort of rapid fire them, but if you need me to repeat them, let me know. Um, will, um, does your, does the clinic assist, um, undocumented individuals? Um, and then I imagine people might be wondering what documentation they do need, um, in order to get assistance. And then lastly, um, have, have you, or are you considering partnering with the high schools, um, where physicals, um, the cost of getting a physical for high school students might be a, a barrier for playing sports? Yeah, I, I can respond to that. Thank you for the, for the question. Um, the first part about documentation, we don't ask for any ID for any of our patients when they come in. Um, doesn't matter to us whether or not they're documented or not. They will get free medical care if they need it. Um, as far as the high school, um, I reached out to the superintendent a couple of years ago, and I apologize, I can't remember her name, but um, we talked about providing some services specifically for sports physicals. And I know since then they've um, got a school-based health center or made I, I, some adjustments, I'm not really sure in terms of school-based health center services um, at the high school in uh, Wallatin and um, we are certainly open to that. Um, we have made the school aware that we are certainly able to provide that for, for people that aren't able to, to get into their own primary care provider or perhaps a school-based health center. Um, we can certainly offer that at no cost. Yep. Other questions? That's a rant. I don't have a question. I just want to congratulate Sandy for her, uh, and Jordan. Um, but I think I met Sandy a couple years ago and it's, I really, if you have not toured the clinic, go, go and tour it and she will be, you'll be amazed at everything that is happening in this community. Um, so thank you so much for this report. It's incredible. Um, and let me know how I can help you. That's that's all I can say. But thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Other questions? Council Pratt. Thank you for uh, you and all your volunteers for providing this great service for our community, the people that need it the most. And I'm wondering, um, first of all, if um, do you have um, do you welcome people from anywhere in this area? Because I, I, you mentioned Tiger Twalton, but I'm wondering if someone's in Wilsonville, do you really care where that line is where someone lives? No, no, absolutely not. Most of our patients do come from um, Washington County because as Jordan mentioned, we're right on the, the line. Um, as you probably know, there's the Volunteer in, in Medicine Clinic that services a lot of the Oregon City area. But no, we've had patients um, come all the way from Portland. Um, yeah, as far as out in Hillsboro, Beaverton. So yeah, we don't we don't limit uh, the patients who can come in to see us. And then I'm wondering if um, what your hope is for this clinic, like in the next five or ten years, and if um, you've considered like um, adding women's health care into that mix. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, our medical director is an OBGYN, Dr. Bond, who practices up at um, OHSU, and she has all along wanted to offer more women's health. Currently, um, for those of you who have, have been in clinic, you know we're basically in curtains. Um, we have no walls or doors, um, so it's difficult to do some of those a um, little bit more invasive type of procedures uh, related to women's health. We are looking, however, we're applying for a grant um, to be able to get a couple of pieces of equipment that Dr. Bond really would like to do, uh, like to have in order to perform certain female um, procedures. So the answer to that question is yes, we're definitely uh, looking down the road to that. We are limited, as I mentioned, because of the, the way that we're set up, but um, that certainly is one of our long-term goals. Thank you. And I would just add beyond that, you know, the, the natural transition would be to expand our services and especially our clinic days. Um, you know, ideally we could be available on a Saturday, um, uh, at least once a month, um, 
but all that depends on our capacity um, and especially our volunteer um, army uh, and their availability. And so um, that's our, our focus is. Any other questions? Council Brooks. Thank you for your work and I uh, appreciate it very much. And um, as a social worker, I kind of always go into mental health and especially with um, the kind of clients and the kind of needs and stressors and really trauma that a lot of folks, I'm sure that you guys see experience. I'm just curious what kind of resources or what the goals are around I guess I'd like to say behavioral health to include substance abuse as well as um, mental health concerns that people are facing. Yeah, that's a really good question. That's That's been a challenge of ours uh, right from the beginning is being able to provide those kind of services to our patients because as you indicated, with the population that we serve, that certainly um, those kind of things um, come to our doorstep. So, up to this point, it's um, we've been trying to refer out to outside agencies who may be willing to see our patients. As I mentioned earlier, that is one of our um, goals uh, down the road is to provide uh, some kind of more um, consistent service to those patients, whether or not it's bringing someone in or whether or not it's referring out to an agency that's willing to work with our patients. Obviously, our patients don't have resources. Um, so finding someone that's willing to do that, um, either on a sliding fee scale or, um, you know, for free, it's, it's tough, um, to do that. So, um, certainly looking for all ideas. If any of you have something uh, that you could share, please feel free to get a hold of me. But it is, it is an area that we do struggle with providing that service to our patients. Definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. I guess most of my questions have been answered, but um, Jordan and Sandy, um, it's just a pleasure to have you here and um, to sh um, hear the evolution. Um, I happen to be uh, in a seat in your building in 2011 and, and had the opportunity to help move that effort forward and know many of your incredible board of directors. And um, I know that your mission and vision and every word has been thought out. And I really just appreciate everything that you have brought forward to our community, but really just um, the spirit in which you've done it in. And I also wanna say that for those of you that are choosing to watch the um, chamber event um, that the Borland Free Clinic has also been nominated. And I apologize, Jordan, I, don't, I didn't memorize the category, uh, but they are also being recognized in a variety of places um, in our community for their incredible um, work. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Again, yes, yes thank, thank you, you, Sandy and Jordan, for coming today and all your efforts and all of the volunteers uh, for having this wonderful asset in our community. Thank you. Thank you for asking us to be here. Appreciate uh, it. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. And thank you all for your work as well. Thanks. All right. Uh, so moving on to special report number two is an update from the Regional Water Providers Consortium. And I think I've seen Nick and I saw our Ms. Geeson. I remember Rebecca from Wago when I was on the board. <laughs> right. Good evening. Yeah. Nice to see you all again, Mayor, Councilors. Um, I'll do a quick introduction and give it over to Rebecca, but we have Rebecca Geisen with us this evening. She is the Managing Director for the Regional Water Providers Consortium, and will be providing an update of what's been going on at the consortium over the last year and what's going on now. So take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor Bubinek, nice to see you again, and Councillor Brooks and um, the rest of the council, thanks for having me here to talk about an organization that you all have been members of for over 20 years. So I think this might be the first time, at least I've come to your uh, city council meeting and talked about the program. So um, I'm excited to be here. So I'm gonna try to share my screen. And 
you all let me know if you see it. We got it. Give me a thumbs up. Okay, great. All right. Well, again, thank you for um, um, having me. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the consortium and some of our programs um, to let you know what your your city is involved with and how we're working together in the region around water supply issues. So a little bit about who we are. Um, the consortium started in the late 90s. Uh, before the consortium, most of the water providers in the region op operated quite autonomously. Um, and there was a recognition of a lot of emerging issues around water supply and that involved acquiring water rights, um, new federal laws, the Clean Water Act, uh, growth, increasing water demand, and uh, folks came together and decided it was time to look at how the region was going to address um, future water supply needs for the next 50 years. And they started by putting together a regional water supply plan. And then the consortium was formed to help implement that plan. So we currently have 24 water providers, most of the water providers in Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington County, and Newburgh joined us a couple of years ago to participate in some of our programs as well. So the consortium has a strategic plan that we recently updated, and we have three focus areas, um, meeting water needs, emergency planning, emergency preparedness and resiliency, and strengthening regional partnerships. Our overall mission is to provide leadership in the planning, management, stewardship, and resiliency of drinking water in the region. Um, the structure of our organization is led by our consortium board of elected officials. Um, Councilor Brooks is, is your representative to the board. We also have an executive committee that advises the board. Um, the board primarily makes policy and budget decisions and the executive committee uh, makes recommendations to the board. And then our technical committee is made up of kind of executive level folks. So Jeff Fox is the representative to the technical committee. And then we also have three working committees made up generally of provider staff. So some of the things that I think are really important about the consortium as far as benefits is that through all of our members, we speak with a unified voice on water issues. Um, I think it's also very valuable that we have this very incredibly group, this incredible group of peers that share their knowledge with each other. Um, we like to represent the collective interests of our members and your customers. And then by working together, we can um, pool our resources and reduce risk uh, and achieve economies of scale around common goals. We're funded by membership dues. So all of our members pay into the consortium based on the number of customer accounts and your average water use. Um, our budget is generally around a million dollars a year. Hello. There we go. So our focus area meeting water needs highlights the need to use our regional water resources as efficiently as possible. In the regional water supply plan, water saved through conservation was considered a source of supply for the region. So um, we take conservation very seriously as a way to meet water needs. We implement a regional water conservation program and media campaign made up of TV, radio, web. Um, you may have seen or heard some of our ads on, on TV or on the radio. Um, we also provide resources to our members to help them educate their customers about the importance of water conservation. And for some, these programs that we implement help our members meet the state requirements for water management and conservation plan. The consortium also provides outreach in multiple languages. Um, we recently updated our website to make it more accessible to uh, diverse audiences. We also work with Portland State to prepare population estimates and forecasts for our members. Um, this is really helpful because all of the providers get their population data using the same methodology around the region. Um, 
We also are very interested in understanding how climate change impacts water supplies. And so we provide forums to discuss that amongst our members and try to keep on top of, of the research going on there. Our other focus area is emergency preparedness and resiliency. Um, our efforts in this area have really grown considerably over the years. And I think one of the great things about the consortium is that we're very uniquely positioned to bring water providers together to participate in trainings and exercises that help providers prepare for a variety of emergencies. And I'll talk about an exercise um, or a drill that we did uh, a couple of years ago in a moment. We also develop resources and studies to help water providers, um, including a regional water interconnection study. So we have a geodatabase of all the water providers and how they're interconnected. And this is, um, can be really helpful for water provider planning efforts and then also to see how water can be moved around the region. And that has been a very helpful planning tool. We also developed a shared worker agreement through the Oregon Water Wastewater Agency Response Network. So if there's a catastrophic emergency and you have maybe someone who lives in Tualatin but works for, um, I don't know, the Portland Water Bureau, but they can't get to Portland, but they can come to Tualatin and they uh, know how to drive a backhoe, then they can go to Tualatin and work. Um, and that agreement is in place for those that have signed it. We also got an, a grant recently to prepare a regional emergency drinking water framework plan. Uh, really excited about that. So this is a, a framework for the region about how to provide drinking water after an emergency. Um, Jeff is serving on our project ta task force for that project as is Nick. Um, and I know Tualatin has some experience in putting together emergency water plans. So uh, we're very looking forward to having their participation. A lot of our work also helps our water providers meet state and federal requirements to prepare with risk assessments and emergency response plans. Let's see, did I, here we go. Um, for the last 12, over the last 12 years, we've been able to help our members leverage over two and a half million dollars in urban area security initiative grants. And some of these were to plant to fund the interconnection study and then this water, drinking water, uh, emergency drinking water plan. We've also um, been able to purchase equipment to help provide drinking water to the public during an emergency. So mobile water treatment systems um, and mobile water distribution systems. And then we've also expanded our, our very robust outreach campaign to include messaging about the importance of having an emergency supply of drinking water. And we've made that messaging available in multiple languages. We have a couple of videos. Actually, we have four videos. Uh, one about getting water out of your water heater um, how to store and prepare water, how to treat water. So some really great resources. And in the next year, we're gonna be translating or reproducing those videos in about 10 different languages. So we can make that information to available to as many folks as possible. All of the members of the consortium are members of Ormorn and have recently stepped up to help other water utilities in need, um, including during the recent wildfires and also the winter ice storm. Um, during Salem's water quality event a couple of summers ago, several members sent down their emergency water distribution systems to help the community there um, and bring them safe drinking water. So it's a great example of how we're more successful and resilient by working together. So our last focus area is around uh, regional partnerships. The consortium is built on partnerships and working together. And I think one of its strengths, as I mentioned, is speaking with one voice on issues of mutual interest and being a forum to discuss and address issues and identify where we wanna use our resources um, the most efficiently. We also strive to be the trusted information, the trusted source of information about drinking water. And I really invite you and encourage you to check out our website um, to look at all the resources we have about drinking water, 
not only conservation and emergency preparedness, but about where our drinking water comes from and why it's important um, and what our rates pay for. And we're working on a, a, some updates to our website, which I'll talk about in a minute that really reinforce that. Uh, we also have a drinking water advisory tool. I, Nick, do you have that on your website? I think you guys do. Um, so this is a great tool because since many people don't know where their water comes from, you can enter your address and it will return with who your water provider is. And then if there's ever a drinking water advisory in the region, uh, this kind of turns over to uh, there's a drinking water advisory, find out if you're impacted and you can enter your address and, and learn more about that. So next I want to just talk a little bit about some of our past projects and then what we're currently working on. So as I mentioned, we did do a drill uh, back in September of 2019. Gosh, that seems like 10 years ago. <laughs> but uh, we had a drill at Riverside Park on the Clackamas River and we invited all of our providers who had any kind of emergency equipment to come and train on that not only owners of the equipment, but other water providers as well, because if they ever need to request it, we want to make sure that they know how to use it. So it's an opportunity to practice and train with each other, um, keep the equipment in working order, practice cooperation and collaboration, and then iron out any kind of issues and make improvements. Um, it's also an opportunity for some staff to get um, continuing education units. So we always try to apply for those so they can maintain certifications. And then we always have after action reports and identify gaps. And sometimes that leads to additional grant funding. So as a result of this drill, we got additional funding to buy some portable water tanks, hose ramps and generators to support our equipment. We've done a lot of work on our website, um, mostly behind the scenes stuff to update the navigation and make it more accessible and user friendly. Um, we've also added some pages in Spanish. And it's, I did not know how much work it goes into making websites ADA compliant, um, but we, we have done a great job uh, with that. And I mentioned that we have uh, some materials in other languages. We've greatly increased our Spanish language outreach. Um, we have TV ads and interviews uh, in Spanish. We have e-newsletters that we also do in Spanish. And um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be working on translating some of our videos into more languages. And then we're gonna be uh, dipping our toe in Russian radio next year as well. In response to COVID-19 and the wildfires, uh, the consortium quickly stepped in to develop messaging about COVID and drinking water. There was a lot of, um, I think, concerns about what the, this meant, what the pandemic meant, if it was gonna impact drinking water, and then saying with the, the wildfires and debris from wildfires. Um, so we put some messaging on our website and provided that to our members so that everyone was sharing the same information. And we provided a messaging toolkit in multiple languages also to let for providers to use to let the community know that their water was safe to drink and that providers were here, here to help, um, including with financial assistance. Um, and then we have been transitioned to working from home and continuing our work from our son's bedroom, who's off to college. <laughs> so some of the things that we're working on now, um, we just collected all kinds of data from all our providers so we can share some information called water by the numbers. So uh, one fun fact, there's almost 47,000 hydrants in our region that are maintained by all of our regional water providers. Uh, so we'll be doing some more messaging about that to just let the public know what goes into bringing safe drinking water um, from, from the source to the tap. And then we're also providing messaging toolkits for our members. Um, so we just did one around drinking water week. And I mentioned the emergency drinking water framework plan that we're working on. Um, we're a longtime sponsor of the Children's Clean Water Festival. And unfortunately this year because of COVID, we couldn't have an in-person festival, but we did uh, move it completely online. 
and there's just some great resources that can be used year round for students and for teachers to learn about water resources in the water cycle and lots of fun activities. And then of course we're working on our summer outreach campaign and our fall emergency preparedness campaign. So here's um, our staff. Uh, you've met me. Um, a lot of folks who work with the consortium are familiar with Patty Burke, who is our management analyst. And then Bonnie Cushman's our outreach coordinator and Riley Berger's our web mastermind. Um, so we have a great staff. I've been with the consortium for over 20 years. Uh, there's a lot of longevity with our members and with our staff. And it's just a great organization, I think. Um, for addressing the needs of the region around drinking water. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or I don't know if Nick or Jeff, you wanna add anything? No, nope. nice, nice job. job. Yeah, thanks for that content. Absolutely. I think you're on mute. Were you gonna say something, Councilor Brooks? Oh. Yeah, I would like to, um, I just want to thank you for coming and I uh, was really pleased to be able to invite you to come after you talked about this presentation. And I will say it's one of the benefits of COVID that that was sent out and that we could have you come today and present to us. So there's so much and it's such a big mission that um, the consortium does and it's such a regional conversation um, that we have. Um, and I do want to say when I first came on to council, we had just, you had just put forth the taking a picture with 14 gallons of water promotion. And I was too late to get in on it. And I've been kind of like wanting to show what a picture of 14 gallons of water is for since I first came on. So I put it together for today as my visual gift <laughs> and um but i i don't know if you guys can see oh my that's, gosh that's awesome that's 14 gallons of water and that's each one of those you know you see those things it's actually 15 gallons you see those um boxes of water at the store and they're two and a half gallons each so that's what it looks like there's um, an extra gallon for maybe your neighbor, your pet, um, but having 14 gallons ready to go in case of an emergency. And what does that look like? Because a lot of us just imagine 14 um, gallon or how many water bottles is that? So I just encourage people to think about it as these types of containers and there's six of them. So you just get six of them for each person and then you'll be ready. And then as far as my two takeaways from this year, one was being having a front seat to the regional cooperation around the fires was really quite an incredible experience for understanding the collaboration of workers in our area. And a lot of it has to do with leadership like from Jeff Fox and Nick that we're so fortunate to have here to contribute. And then I guess my final thing was, you know, we see all the climate change concerns and how we're looking at resiliency together and how this organization has been thinking about this for a long time. So with, you know, in Washington County, we had uh, burn warnings, no burn warnings in April, which to me was kind of um, early for talking about water issues this early in the season, I'm just curious your thoughts about what, we, what we're looking at for water um, coming into the year and how important, and, the, and then just, and just so everybody knows too, we have links to the consortium website right on our website. And there's also really cool information about, you know, uh, drought resistant plants and different ways to take care of your own environment to be more conservation, you know, thinking forward. So anyway, I'll go back to my question. Thank you again for coming. I'm very excited you're here. Oh, thank you. Um, so as far as the outlook for summer and water supply, I think 
you know, for the state, obviously there's some counties that are in very serious drought situations already. Um, the metro region tends to fare pretty well based on the sources that we have, but it really is very source specific. Um, you know, the bull run really relies on rainfall in May and June. Um, so it's kind of hard to know how that system will be impacted. The Clackamas is snow melt and run of river. So it really depends on the flows of the Clackamas. I'm not sure how things are adding up there. Uh, the Trast Wallatin generally tends to fare pretty well. And we have a lot of folks who have secondary sources as well. So um, we generally fare pretty well in the metro area, but not necessarily in the state. But we also have very great conservation programs and people do their part in the summer to shave that peak off as well. So we'll see how it plays out. I'm not sure yet. And take a picture of your, your water supply and maybe we'll use it uh, during preparedness month. We love to have pictures and examples of people being prepared. So that would be great. I sure will. All right, great. Thank, Thank you again, you. everybody. Any other questions for Rebecca, Nick, or Jeff? Okay. Well, thank you for coming, Rebecca. Yeah, this is the first time I think the consortium's come in years, so it's very informative. And a lot of folks don't know about the consortium, so it's always good to hear from you and know that um, the region does work together to address water issues. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy to be here, and let me know if you want me to come back. All right. All right, thanks. Nice. Bye. All right, so special report number three is now from the Tualatin Planning Commission. Their annual report. Good evening, Mayor and uh, City Councilors. This is Bill Beers, your Tualatin Planning Commissioner. And Steve, you'll be paging through these slides for me. It will be, thank you. Perfect, thanks. Let's go on to the first one then. So this is your, um, this is pretty close to the current planning commission. That's being in the upper left-hand corner and then working our way across Vice Chair Mona St. Clair, Ursula Kuhn, Alan Applin, and on the bottom row, Janelle Thompson, Daniel Bach-Huber, and Mitch Green, who uh, recently uh, left us. He tendered his resignation, so we have an open spot. Um, so encourage folks to apply. Uh, I, like, I like having a full commission. All right, let's go to the next slide, please, Steve. So the planning commission's role, uh, our first role is to fulfill Oregon <coughs> statewide land use planning goal one of citizen involvement. Uh, so we're just one more way to pass citizen comments and uh, perspective onto the city council. Um, we also serve as an advisory capacity to the city council. Um, Mayor Frank has been around long enough to remember when we were the Tualatin Planning Advisory Committee before we became a commission. Uh, so at that point, we were only in an advisory capacity. Uh, but now we do things uh, listed in the third bullet, um, some quasi-judicial things like transitional use permits, sign variances, reinstatement of use, and some of the others that Steve has listed there. All right, uh, next slide, please, Steve. Uh, so some of the recommendations we made to council were on topic, the kind of the main topics for me were the uh, Basalt Creek residential text changes. Like I think that's the, that's gonna be with us for a while. And so this really kind of kicked it off this year. And then uh, an update to the cannabis code. All right, and the next slide there, Steve. And we ha only had one conditional use permit uh, this year, and this was, uh, we approved the Banfield Pet Hospital on a conditional use, and that's gonna be there at the corner of Nyberg and Martin Azzi, where the, uh, the Thai food restaurant used to be. All right, uh, next one. And then um, we also kind of get all of the inside scoop on all the things that are happening in Tualatin and uh, the broader area at large. Uh, lots, uh, lots of focus, of focus on housing on this year, year and that's going to, or last year and continuing into this year. And you kind of see that popping up in those bullet points. Um, that's kind of short and sweet. <laughs> that's what we did last year and kind of a similar, similar to what we'll be doing next year. But if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Okay. 
pictures are back. Questions for Bill? Pretty quiet. Council Brooks. I don't know if I have a question, but I just want to thank you. I think land use um, issues are complicated and it takes a lot of energy and effort. And you're, um, like you said, your advisory committee is now full commission. So that's a lot of work. And I appreciate the diligence that you um, and the commission do to um, prepare us to make the best decisions that we can make and inform us. and. Um, even things are complicated and even controversial. Uh, I've just noticed that you speak to those um, points of view very well and give us a very give us a very balanced report of what you're thinking and um, your consideration. So I don't think it's an easy role and I really appreciate um, your service. Thank you. Well, I think we're seeing so, Council Brooks, I appreciate it. Uh, questions or comments? I want to thank you, Bill. You've been there a long time. <laughs> and some of the names there have been there a long time also. So I, I appreciate the years of service you've given to the commission. And before that, when it was not a commission yet, and the folks that are on the commission, uh, it gives the city great consistency that yeah, we have longtime commissioners who know the history of the city and know um, have their feet, you know, firmly planted in the city. And so I appreciate your, your comments, your stances and your feedback to us. And uh, I look forward to another, are you gonna stick around for another year or so? Yes. Uh, All right. So the next meeting we have, we're gonna do uh, our kind of internal elections for chair and vice chair. So okay. I'm happy to pass that torch on if someone else wants to. <laughs> All right. And you may be seeing guess. me again. Yeah, and I usually get a lot of uh, folks now that they know there's an MPC for Planning Commission that uh, I know our Citizens Appointment Committee will be vetting those pretty soon. Uh, it's an exciting commission to be on and it makes some very important decisions. So I, uh, I encourage folks to apply to be on the Planning Commission. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. You're welcome. All right. Good night, folks. Good night. So moving on to our next item, it's a public hearing, which is quasi-judicial. It's item number one, consideration of ordinance number 1456-21, annexing approximately 4.66 acres of property located to uh, 23,500 23, Southwest Bloomsbury Road, tax ID 2S135D0003, and exiting the territory into the boundary of Fiumara Services and withdrawing the territory from the Washington County Enhanced Sheriff Patrol District, file number ANN 20 004. I've got a script that I need to read per the Oregon Legislature, and I'll start with that right now. Uh, the state legislature requires the following information to be read. The criteria for approval of a proposed annexation are contained in TDC 33.010 and include A, the territory to be annexed is within the metro urban growth boundary. B, the owner of the territory to be annexed have petitioned to be annexed. C, the application is consistent with applicable provisions of ORS chapter 222. D, the property is contiguous to the city are separated from it only by a public right of way or stream, ORS 222. E, the annexation is consistent with directly applicable criteria for boundary changes in Metro Code 3.09, including an urban service provider agreement or annexation plan adopted under ORS 195.065, an urban planning or other agreement other than those under ORS 195.065 between the affected entity and a necessary party, a comprehensive plan and public facility plan, a regional framework plan or functional plan, the annexation will promote or the annexation will promote or not interfere with the timely, orderly, and economic provisions of public facilities and services. The applicable criteria for the annexation is consistent with the state and local law. Item number two. Testimony and evidence presented must be directed toward the above criteria or those criteria in its Walton Development Code 
or other laws which you believe apply to this decision. Item number three, prior to the conclusion of evidentiary portion of this hearing, any participant may request an opportunity to present additional evidence, arguments, or testimony regarding the application. The council must grant the request by either continuing the public hearing to a date certain or leaving the record open for an additional seven days to allow additional written evidence, arguments, or testimony to be presented. Item five, failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the council and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal to the plan use board of appeals based on that issue. Item six, the failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to the proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow this council to respond to the issue may preclude an action for damages in circuit court. Item seven, the hearing will begin with city staff report followed by the testimony from the applicant. The council will then hear testimony from any person in favor of the application followed by any person opposing the application. The applicant will then be allowed to provide rebuttal testimony and argument. Once all testimony and argument has concluded, the council will close the evidentiary portion of the hearing and will deliberate towards a decision. And finally, item number eight, if any council members wish to announce any potential conflicts of interest, bias, or ex parte contact, they should do so now. Council Pratt. I have had communications with the teams, but I don't think it will bias my direction on this. I see Sean's face going, what? I don't know if that's related, but I just... Was the communication related to this application? It was not at all related to this. Okay, great. Thank you. I probably spoke out of turn here. All right. Anyone else? All right. We'll now begin with a presentation from city staff. Good evening. I am Tabitha Boschetti, assistant planner, the city of Tualatin. I'm going to pull up a quick presentation here as part of our staff report to share with you this evening. One second here. My computer has frozen just a wee bit. Okay. I think we're back online. So as the mayor has described, we are here to discuss the annexation application for 23500 Southwest Boones Ferry, also sometimes addressed as 23550. And in general, when, of course, when we're talking about an annexation, we're really talking about a revision to city boundaries and districts. So these changes as proposed would apply to all of the standards and zoning for any future activities, whereas the property is currently within Washington County's jurisdiction. No development is being considered as part of this particular application, just that kind of boundary readjustment. So, of course, where are we talking about? So we are talking about this property on Boones Ferry. If you're familiar with the Horizon Church campus, very much tucked into there. On your screen, this teal line that surrounds the property is actually the existing city boundary. So this property is a single parcel that is actually surrounded by existing city currently on all sides, particularly as some of the properties to the south were recently annexed just this past year. The current property owner, Community Partners for Affordable Housing, has initiated this annexation request as part of the Salt Creek Concept Plan area. This property is already designated to be zoned as high density residential upon annexation, so not necessarily as a separate consideration, just kind of a result of that previous planning effort. With an annexation, there would also be a few districts changed from county to city responsibility, and we're also looking at a simultaneous annexation into the Clean Water Services District, which helps facilitate sewer and stormwater issues as we look to those in the future. So just a quick look at that zoning map. 
uh, where you see that uh, high density residential in the orange. Um, so without uh, going back over all of the uh, existing criteria, um, the full stack report is in the agenda packet for this evening's meeting. Um, we're happy to talk about uh, any of those criteria more in depth, but in general, uh, the stack report does conclude that those criteria can be shown to be met. Um, and as such, uh, staff recommends approval of this case file and adoption of ordinance 1456-21. Though of course, this being a public hearing, uh, we'll hear from many folks. And of course we can talk about following that recommendation, possible path to denial, or a possible path to continuing discussion of this case. Uh, so I'm happy to answer any questions at this particular juncture. Um, but we could also continue. Thank you. Thanks, Tabitha. Uh, at this point, I'll now invite the applicant and give them the opportunity to provide any evidence or testimony in support of their application. Good evening, Ms. Duke. Hi, I'm here with uh, Jillian, and Jillian's going to start us off with a PowerPoint. Hi, I'm uh, Jillian Siraj Felton. I'm the Director of Housing Development at Community Partners for Affordable Housing, and I have a little presentation to share with you. Give me a moment. While, while Jillian's getting that up, I'm Rachel Duke. I'm the Executive Director at Community Partners for Affordable Housing, and we are really, really happy to be here tonight. So can I just jump right in there, Jillian? Yes. yes. All right. Well, uh, good evening. We're really, as I said, we're, we're excited to be here tonight um, to give you uh, uh, to talk about our application. Um, we we know that um, we know we're here to talk about the annexation, but we're also going to just spend some time letting you know who we are and kind of what we're planning to do. So this is a visual of what we're planning to develop. It's called Plum Beck Gardens, named after a uh, long time Tualatin resident and former SEPA board member, Doug Plombeck. Um, and we're really excited to share some of this information. So I guess next slide. Jillian. So obviously, um, well, little Princess Bride reference never hurts, but uh, this is as, as Tabitha already went over, this is we're here for the annexation um, process. It's part of you know the very first step in the land use process. We are, um, you know, a very high tech drawing skills here will point to the property where the property is. Um, the medium and low density residential that is around here, I know has, I believe both, um, there's two parcels and I think they've both already been annexed. Um, and I believe Horizon School is already in the city boundary too. So we are the, the last parcel on this side of the road, um, to my knowledge, to be annexed in. And then just a little bit about uh, SEPA as a organization. This is, will be our first affordable, regulated affordable housing development in the city of Tualatin. So you may not be familiar with our work. So we just kind of wanted to talk about us for a few minutes um, by way of introduction. So we have been in operations for 27 years. We were founded by a group um, and a local church that noticed the need for affordable housing and came together to start uh, providing a solution to the lack of affordable housing. And to date, we have 468 units of sustainable and service enriched housing. Um, those are in 10 multifamily properties and we have six single family homes, including the two homes that are on the proposed, uh, the site that's proposed to be annexed. We have 12, currently have 12 staff and hundreds of volunteers. Um, and yeah, we've got a, a really, really great team that is uh, pushing forward a lot of really great designs and services. Uh, so Rachel Duke already uh, introduced herself. I'm Jillian. Uh, Jeff Taylor is our associate housing developer who will also be working on this project with me. Our, we have, uh, we're working with Carlton Hart Architects. We've worked with them on several properties and LMC construction. And uh, Wenaha Group is providing construction management. They are an um, indigenous owned construction management company. So, oh, and LMC is actually located in the city of Tualatin. So it's really great to be able to work with them kind of in their hometown. 
Um, I think it's the first time they've had the opportunity to work with us in their hometown, so we're pretty stoked. These are some of our recent buildings. Just thought you might be interested to see the work that we do. Red Rock Creek Commons is in this top corner. It was just opened, it's 48 units and it's currently fully leased in the city of Tigard. Cedar Grove um, is 44 units and contains some two and three bedrooms. We're also um, housing formerly homeless fam families there in a partnership with Community Action, uh, which has been going really well. And then this is the Knoll, which is the senior property that we have also in Tigard. So just, just some highlights from our portfolio so you can kind of see what our vibe is. Um, and then I'll go ahead and ask uh, Rachel to talk a little bit about the services that we provide. So um, just to share, uh, SIPA really does four things. Um, one of them is we build affordable housing. And so Jillian just showed you some uh, pictures of some of the communities that we have. Uh, we care a lot about what our housing looks like. Uh, we think our housing is beautiful. Um, we've heard other people describe it as beautiful, so we don't think we're really off base. Um, we also make sure that when we build that housing, um, it lasts into the future. So it's not just about getting those units on the ground, but we asset manage it. We know that each of those housing communities has, in some cases, need, needed up to 15 different funding sources to come together. Each of those funding sources has requirements and compliance and is a public investment. And we treat each of those assets like a jewel. We care a lot that they um, last uh, a long time and that they're well used. Um, the other thing that we do at those properties is we support the residents who live there. We work really hard to make sure that our households are successful. Some of our buildings are senior housing and we have senior programming. Um, many of our buildings have families and we do a lot of work to make sure that kids have after school programming or they have summer camp. Uh, we've done some really creatively socially distant summer camp and, and programming for the kids for the last 12 months. Um, kind of pivoting to make sure that we're still supporting families right now, especially. Um, in fact, our staff have been hard at work uh, making sure that our residents have access to rent assistance so that um, folks are, when the eviction moratorium is over, that our residents are, are solid and able to keep going and stay housed. Uh, keeping our residents housed is paramount to us. And so that third thing that we do there is really around in, in supporting our residents. And then the fourth thing that we do is uh, really engaging with the communities that we serve in Washington County and being part of the policy conversations and planning efforts. Um, I was part of some of the uh, 12 and 2040 conversations that were happening. Um, we were engaged with Tigard and Beaverton. So we really care a lot about the communities that we're serving and we stay, uh, we stay connected to the work that's being done. This particular building that we're talking about this evening, we have some real exciting partnerships planned, including um, community action, Centro Cultural, uh, working to make sure that we are providing access uh, to workforce services and um, asset building to our families who will be staying there. So um, that's just a quick description of the kind of work that we do. Jillian? Yep, um, I, Rachel covers it all so well. Um, one, I just wanted to bring in one other element of design that we have been incorporating is something known as trauma-informed design. A lot of people come with the needing services and uh, if you've been homeless or have experienced trauma in your life, you know, you, you are in that fight or flight mode all the time and there are elements to design that can actually calm the mind down. And, and so we just wanted to put some, a few examples of the thought that we put in to every building um, and try and, and make the experience of living better for our residents. Uh, so here's a little sneak peek of our proposed project. Um, we currently own the, the site that was partially funded with $500,000 from uh, the Washington County Housing, Housing Production Opportunity Fund. Um, we are proposing quite a few large units, three and four bedroom units. All of the work that we've done in the area speaks to families really needing housing and large families needing housing and there just being not a lot available. We are planning to zone for about 116 units of regulated affordable housing. And uh, this will include the Metro bond funds and home funds. So, uh, and 
uh, housing opportunity funds would total about 16.2 million of public investment. Um, we were gonna pair that with 26.4 million in private investment from lenders and uh, investors in the project. So that's um, the, a lot of committed funds to the project already and uh, we're excited to move forward. A little bit, I'm sure you all are aware of the area housing needs. Um, a lot of this information I, is from the study that uh, was done in Tualatin, but right now about half of Tualatin renters pay more than 30% in housing costs, which would put them in what's called cost burdened. It's considered if you pay more than 30% of your gross income for housing, that you are cost burdened. That is, that is, there are too many other things that one needs to do with their money to not make that a, a poverty situation. Um, workforce housing is really needed. There's a, a lot more jobs in Tualatin than housing. And so bringing additional affordable options helps lower commute times, increase stability, um, and just you know provide a place for folks that are working to work. Um, and uh, so a little bit about who is in our housing. Uh, it's all sorts of people. Um, you, it's not, there we go. So at 60% of area median income is about 37,000 for a single person, about 53,000 for a household of four. And in the, in 2020, five of the 10 fastest growing jobs were jobs that paid below 60% area median income, and they were all frontline workers. All five of those fastest growing jobs were, would be considered frontline workers. And so that's really who we're housing when we're talking about workforce housing are people that, that are working really hard and uh, making a difference in our community and need a place that they can live without worrying how they're gonna make it paycheck to paycheck. A um, little bit more about uh, what we're planning to do here. All of the units will be at 60% area median income and below. Some will be at 50, some at 40, quite a few at 30%. Amenities, we have planned a community room that includes a classroom, an outdoor play area, some community gardens, and then offices for those partners that Rachel was talking about to actually come on site and provide services to the residents where they are to really meet them where they're at. Um, and we have... Uh, spent the last year in the Permanent Supportive Housing Institute and, and are looking to provide some units of permanent supportive housing here, le leveraging the um, Metro tax levy. There we go, not the bond, tax levy. So uh, that's it. You know, we purchased the property last year. We're moving forward. We're currently in design development. We're targeting a construction start of next, of uh, end of, second quarter of next year. That's uh, what we're looking now. Things come up, government shut down, so that could change, but that's what we're working with right now. So thank you very much for letting us introduce ourselves to you. We look forward to answering any questions. I know that this meeting is specifically about annexation, but as I said at the beginning, since this is really our first project, we wanted to take the opportunity to introduce ourselves and um, field any questions and uh, kind of let you get to know us, because I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of us as we continue the land use process. <laughs> All right, thank you. So now we'll hear uh, from those folks in the Zoom meeting who want to testify in support of the application. To everyone at the poll center or in the meeting, we'd like to voice support of the application. Uh, Mayor, I have no one at the poll center, and if anyone does have, they can simply raise their hand, turn on the camera, raise their hand, or put their hand up as the reaction. We can call on you, but I have no comments from anyone on the side of the list. Right. Uh, now I'll switch gears and say uh, now we'll have hear from those opposed to the application. All right. Mr. Lucini. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to make a few comments. My name is John Lucini. Uh, my wife Grace and I live at 23677 Southwest Boones Ferry Road in unincorporated Washington County. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to make uh, some comments regarding the proposed annexation 20-004, uh, the CEPA uh, project and property. 
Our property is located within a thousand feet of their location and is west and slightly south of the area of the proposed annexation. We have also uh, submitted uh, detailed written comments to the council earlier today. We understand this hearing is for an annexation request and is not a property development hearing. Um, and please understand that we're not opposed to the annexation per se, nor are we opposed to CPAS project on the property. Um, however, it is our belief that the city is not sufficiently complied with land use laws and good urban planning principles with regard to the annexation. As described in our written comments, we have the following concerns. Um, the city of Tualatin lacks adoption of two documents required by the state, which are needed in the evaluation of land use planning actions and are relevant to this proposed annexation. Uh, first off, the city lacks an adopted stormwater management plan for the Basalt Creek area, as is required by the state for public facilities planning. Since the city lacks a stormwater management plan for the area and the existing system has previously failed, the sequencing of when SEPA will be able to access connections to an existing or new offsite conveyance or treatment system facility um, for their stormwater is not been established. The city of Tualatin adopted natural resource maps that lack inclusion of any data developed with a clear and objective standards, conditions, and procedures from the goal five, excuse me, natural resources inventory for the Basalt Creek area. As a result, it is unclear how the city is able to assess and minimize the potential impacts of stormwater following, flowing from the upstream location of the SEPA annexation will have, what kind of effect it will have on downstream natural resource resources requiring protection. Um, our second concern is more of a procedural issue. Um, the annexation application included a certification of signposting, which is required by the 12th and code. Um, I noticed in the CPAR presentation, they did show a picture of the Boone's Ferry Road site with a sign on it. Um, whether they're disappeared or someone took them down or whatever, uh, we checked the last three or four uh, over the last week approximately and didn't see any signs of that type in front of the, in front of the property. Um, and our concern there is that the citizen involvement opportunities for the resident residents of the Salt Creek area have been problematic. Uh, and if in fact there were no signs, um, it makes it difficult or for the, um, the citizens of the area to know that there is a potential annexation. Uh, they might not be aware of how to obtain information of the action or when the only hearing on this action might take place. As a result, they wouldn't have the opportunity to make comments on the proposed annexation. Because of these issues, um, we're requesting the city council continue this hearing to a date certain in the future when the city has complied with the development and adoption of a stormwater management plan for the Basalt Creek area, which will address the many stormwater management issues which present themselves. We would like to make it clear again that our issues here are with the city and not with CEPA. However, the city and or CEPA should address the need for identification of how CEPA will provide safe and efficient stormwater management for their Boone's Ferry Road property as part of an annexation process that complies with federal, state, and regional mandates. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Lizbachini. Uh, are there any other folks who'd like to voice opposition to the application? See anybody, Bates, in the, uh, I only see one screen, so. I do not see anyone, man. All right. So uh, this is the opportunity for CIFA and or city staff to rebut uh, the uh, opinion of Mr. Lucini. So Tabitha and or Rachel or Jillian. I wanted to know, I don't wanna step on Tabitha at all. 
Um, so we are currently in concept design phase. We have not gotten to the point where we are engineering our stormwater plan. We've not gotten to the point where, um, and, and that usually comes as part of the land use process. The annexation actually helps with that because we can, once we're in the city, we're gonna be able to work with city planners and city staff and CWS who are actually not, not able to, to really get to the meat of what we need to do. So, um, so the annexation is kind of the first step and then the stormwater will really be part of our land use application. And as I had um, stated, uh, in my in my email to uh, Ms. Lucchini that uh, we are actually held to a higher standard because we have federal funds in this project. We're held to a higher standard of stormwater quality and um, CWS already is going to require that we reduce the, st the stormwater flow. Exactly how we come to that is an engineering question that um, Unfortunately, I'm a, I'm a Jill of all trades and expert in none. That's kind of the role of developer. So I can't tell you exactly how that will be engineered, but we would be happy once it is completed to bring it back and have our um, engineers, at, which is Vega, walk anyone through that, that wanted to know how we were managing that stormwater flow. So right now, it, this is part step one in a very multi-step process. Um, and we would be glad to come back and keep you updated, but step one is definitely being annexed into the city so that we can more efficiently work with city uh, staff as well as clean water services to make sure we're on the right track. And what we're designing is acceptable both on an engineering basis and on a code basis to both of those entities. I, I would also just add that if you look at the picture um, at the beginning of that PowerPoint or the, what Tabitha sh also showed is this is this is a like a missing puzzle piece out of the puzzle. Um, the, 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 the area around is, is all annexed in and so we're just asking to be treated the same way that our neighbors have been. Do you have anything to add Tabitha or Steve? I think just to, add, oh, oh, oh. Just, just to add, I think that both the council and staff is uh, certainly shares several of the concerns that the Lucinis have and look forward to resolving them in the future. Um, I think that we believe that overall the findings and then the evidence on the record specific to the criteria for annexation at this hearing um, support approval of the application, but of course we defer to to council to make the ultimate decision. All right. All right, and at this point now, I'll open the floor for questions of the applicant, staff, or folks who are in opposition or in favor of the application of council. No questions. Council President Grimes. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question to go back to the Lucchini's um, concern. I guess Sean or Sharon, and this might be a question for you guys. Are we missing a piece of the stormwater master plan that impedes us from annexing this piece of property? Or is that just a shade of that argument? Or an opinion that something is needing to be clarified that hasn't been clarified because I think that was the basis of Mr. Lucini's comment or one of them at least. Um, I will defer to planning and turn or uh, Sean in terms of um, the legal anal the analysis of that but my understanding is that um, we are working on a stormwater master plan associated with Basalt Creek, but that is not one of the criteria associated with the annexation. Uh, and the staff report in detail does ask about the timeliness of an annexation, particularly with regard to the future ability to provide for infrastructure. Um, so in this particular case, um, as you'll see in those findings, you know, we look at some of the ways in which CEPA in particular is continuing to work with the city, work with clean water services, and work with those neighboring property owners who have also recently annexed into the city. Um, and we certainly respect that there can be 
uh, stronger approaches to our long range planning in the future and certainly uh, ways that we as a city can can look to greater heights in our long range planning efforts. Um, but the scope for annexation is a bit more narrow to my understanding. Councilor Pratt and Councilor Brooks. I'm going to get in the uh, weeds a little here because I heard them, um, the Lucini's mentioned um, concerns that no signage was posted. I swear I remember a sign about a week ago when I went by there about, and I know it said annexation on it, but um, I just want to confirm if the signage was posted and if um, you, I mean, if it had been removed, if you were not aware of that. We, that's that's exactly. exactly. And uh, Jillian had a picture of it in her presentation and um, we did not know that it was missing. If it was missing. I can nor add. Oh. I was just gonna say, nor was it brought to staff's attention previously. So um, we didn't have an opportunity to cure that. Yeah, our, our code gives uh, applicants 48 hours to put the sign back up after we find out and after we tell them. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, yeah, not finding out this afternoon. So, so definitely in the future. Also, Brooks. I, I could say I, I posted the sign myself, so I know that it was. <laughs> it absolutely was posted at some point. I, it might have been blown down by the winds recently, but I, I assure you that it was there. My well, actually, my comment was my question was similar. So, I too have seen the sign posted. So. Um, I don't know how recently it's been gone, but it was definitely, I've seen it, I, I, I saw it um, less than a week ago. Um, anyway, but yeah, it is really good if someone sees something missing to let us know right away and then we can cure it like they said, which that's a new term for me. That was my question, thanks. Any other questions from city council? All right, uh, seeing none, I'll now close the hearing and council can begin deliberations. If there's no deliberations, I'm happy to make a motion for a first reading by title only. Second. I have a motion and a second for a reading by title, first reading by title only. Uh, resolution, uh, what am I? Ordinance number 1456-21. Any discussion on the motions? Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Council President Grimes. Aye. And the chair votes aye also. Ordinance number 1456-21, an ordinance annexing territory at 23500 Southwest Boone's Ferry Road, tax map 2S135D, lot 303 into the city of Tualatin, withdrawing the territory from the Washington County Enhanced Sheriff Patrol District and annexing territory in the, into the boundary of Clean Water Services. Annexation number ANN 20 0004. I'll make a motion for a second reading by Tyler Lee. Second. I have a motion and a second for a second reading by Tyler only of ordinance number 1456 21. Any discussion on the motions? Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Council, uh, Council Reyes. <laughs> yes. Council President Grimes. Aye. I vote aye also. Ordinance number 1456-21, an ordinance annexing territory at 23500 Southwest Boonesbury Road, tax map 2S135D, lot 303 into the city of Tualatin, withdrawing the territory from the Washington County Enhanced Sheriff Patrol District and annexing territory into the boundary of Clean Water Services. 
and next station number ANN 20-0004. I'll make a motion that we adopt ordinance number 1456-21. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt ordinance 1456-21. Any discussion on those motions? Council Brooks. Aye. Council Pratt. Aye. Council Hillier. Aye. Council Sacco. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. President Grimes. Aye. And I vote aye also. It's unanimous. All right. The ordinance is passed. All right. Next up, we now move into general business. Uh, item number one is consideration of resolution number 5538-21 authorizing the city manager to execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Tiger 12th School District number 23J related to the school resource officer program. We have any presentation or anything, Sherilyn, or no? Oh, there's Chief Steele. Yes, the Chief. You're unmuted. <laughs> yes, I couldn't let you off that easy. So good evening, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of Council, Bill Steele, your Chief of Police. We're going to talk a little bit about our school resource officer program and i'm going to share my screen and since you get to hear from me every now and then i invited a special guest uh sergeant jeremy rankin is with us tonight and he's going to actually walk us through the slides if you don't know sergeant rankin he's our uh sergeant assigned to our detectives and uh supervises the school resource officer program as well so He's been with the city for a number of years, and I'm going to turn it over to him and let him yeah, walk into the slides. Good evening, uh, Council and Mayor. I'm happy to be with you tonight. And, uh, yeah, we. Uh, this is a uh, slideshow that uh, the Chief and I uh, had to present uh, regarding the uh, SRO program with the Tualatin Police Department. Um, this slide here is a brief history of it, uh, of the, the SRO program. Um, We've had a, a, a partnership with the Target 12 School District since 1987 when our uh, police department was formed. Um, over the years, the, the program has grown from one officer to three officers, which is what we had prior to the uh, prior to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic last March when the schools were, uh, were closed. Um, the last full year, we had two SROs assigned to Tualatin High School, and one SRO was assigned to Hazelbrook Middle School. Um, they also share responsibilities for the three elementary schools in Tualatin, as well as uh, Mitch Charter School, and then um, Horizon uh, High and uh, Middle School and Elementary School. Um, all of our staff are certified great uh, curriculum instructors. Uh, in the GREAT uh, is an acronym for the Gang Resistance Education and Training Program. And we've been involved that program since 1994. Uh, roles have definitely evolved. Uh, I've been supervising our SRO program for the last three years, and it's evolved in that time and, and over the 30 years to include new responsibilities and training. And in the fall of 2020, uh, the city of Tualatin partner, partnered with uh, Tiger Tualatin School District, as well as the Tiger Police Department for a community review of the SRO program. The summary of the uh, community process, um, uh, the, as I said previously, the uh, Tiger City of Tiger Police Department, City of Tualatin Police Department, um, had and, and the school district contracted facilitators who uh, were tasked to conduct several listening groups and interviews uh, throughout the fall. Um, throughout those interviews, students, staff, administrators, uh, members of the police department, parents and community members uh, learned more about the school resource officer program in the schools. Uh, Committee surveys that were conducted by the school district indicated overwhelming, but not 100% support for the program. Uh, the facilitators uh, encapsulated uh, participants' experiences, perspectives, concerns, and hopes for the future of the SRO program. Uh, after the completion, there were six key themes that emerged. Um, and we can go on to those on the next slide. The six key themes that emerged from the facilitators report were the uh, perception of safety around the schools, uh, student and staff interactions with the SRO. Uh, there was a definite lack of clarity around SRO uh, roles and responsibilities that was uh, voiced by the community, staff, and students. 
there was a uh, feedback and uh, a need for uh, continuous improvement was identified, um, structural issues with the program, and then ongoing socio-political issues with the SRO. Uh, so two uh, officer, it's actually Brian Miller and Kevin Miller are scheduled to uh, return to Tualatin High School starting next Monday, a uh, week from today, May 3rd, 2021. Uh, Nesros will be primarily responsible for responding to calls. Uh, if there are some in the city, they also respond during the day, uh, if there's, uh, you know, priority calls near the schools. They will present two classes and address all of their issues uh, and handle all calls uh, for the schools in the city of Tualatin. This proposed contract is the remainder of this 2020-2021 uh, school year and the entirety of next school year, 2021-2022. And there's going to be an SRO task force that is established to ensure that new responsibilities of the district and SROs are being met. So some of the central roles, uh, roles of the SROs and responsibilities, and this is some of the things that came out of our uh, the focus group community uh, events, was that they are present at the school to ensure safety of the students and the staff. Um, they respond to emergency calls that are within the proximity of the school, uh, investigate all child abuse referrals that involve students at various schools within the district or the city. Uh, they're to attend school-related staff meetings and integrate with the school staff, attend bi-monthly meetings with student affinity and alliance groups, participate with the school district's diversity, equity, and inclusion training, and investigate any criminal allegations that have any access to the school. Any, qu any questions about that for either myself or the chief? Um, I see this goes through the 2022 school year. Um, will there be a review process at that point if this will continue or not? Yeah, I'll kind of weigh in on that one. So through the, the process, it, it brought to light some areas that we can improve the program. Uh, I think the program for at least the Tualatin side has been very solid for a number of years, but it gives us an opportunity to look at things a little bit differently. Uh, and some of that, that feedback came from the process. So that's definitely on the radar, uh, probably uh, not right at the beginning of the school year next year, but it definitely no later than midway through the school year. I see us getting back together a group and presenting information. If this council would like, it would be happy to do that, but making sure we include the, the school board as well. It's just some of the, the things that have been addressed and additional way we, we've, we've changed the way we do business and any other ways that we might change moving ahead. So that's definitely on our radar for the first part of next year. Okay, and then my other question is just kind of more curiosity, but I know there was Discussion about the police were in full uniforms and all their equipment. Will they still be going in with all their equipment? Yeah, so the uniforms right at this point aren't going to change. We're going to do a little bit better job of educating not only the, the students, but the staff at the schools about why we wear certain things on a uniform and, and why it's important. So that won't initially change uh, for this year or going into next year. But as we continue to meet with the different groups, if that becomes a an issue we need to address, we'll definitely look at that for sure. Thank you. President Gray. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I got the impression from the uh, PowerPoint slide that we had more than two officers assigned in the SRO role previously, and now we're just going to have two at the high school. Am I misinterpreting that or are we cutting back? No. You are spot on. So in the past, we did have three officers assigned into the schools. Uh, the financial terms uh, have not changed uh, for the new contract as opposed to the last contract. Uh, the school district reimburses us for half of one position, basically. Uh, we made the decision for this year, at least, since uh, a number of students aren't attending the schools, we're, we're going to start, we're going to finish this school year with, with two officers assigned to the schools. Uh, we've got some other uh, things coming our way that we're going to have to manage our resources appropriately. We've hopefully got a partnership coming with the mental health response team that's going to, you know, take some resources. So we're just continually reassessing how we deploy our, our personnel 
uh, into those roles. So that's what we're going to finish the school year off with this year. And then as we move into next year, we'll, we'll kind of reassess that and see if that need is there or if we've got something else that's a higher priority. Okay, so when you, so even though that this encompasses the 2021-2022 school year in the fall, we could maybe have a discussion about resource allocation as a council and as a police department about getting more resources sure. back in the school. Yeah, so the way the contract is written is it will we'll provide, the city will provide two officers at a minimum uh, and that's the same language that's been for for years in the past uh, so yes that's something we could have another discussion as we move forward in the next school year it just seems i mean i know there's just need everywhere these days but you know I, the, the sros you know a lot of the testimony that really hit me hard when we were doing the community listening groups is so much good that they've done in the school for so many kids and there was a lot of you know first person testimony about the impact that sro officers had on kids and it's safe to see us you know go back to make such a big change you know i'm, I'm not going to disagree with you whatsoever and i think that's one of the reasons we really stood firm with our commitment to the program because we think for as Sergeant Rankin pointed out, for the last 30, 34 years, they've done a lot of great things. So it's important for us to continue to, to fill that role in our, our schools. And if there's things that we need to adjust different and do differently, we're, we're open to that. And again, I got to give credit to Sergeant Rankin and, and Officer Brian Miller, especially because they're the ones that were really, you know, knee deep in the community process and were as open as could be during all of those conversations about if there's something we need to be doing differently on our end, we're definitely open to, you know, listening to those concerns and, and working our way through whatever might be out there. Other questions for Chief Steele or Sergeant Rankin? All right. Council discussion. Um, one thing I want to do add is that I want to thank the Tucker Walton School District uh, Chair uh, Gershmead and Ben Bowman, Vice Chair, for changing two things, two words in the contract. <laughs> they uh, listened to what I had to say and the feedback I had. Uh, they immediately took it back to the board. Uh, they made the changes in the contract and uh, Ben Bowman texted me during the meeting right now, said the TTSD has unanimously approved the contract on their side, uh, and they appreciated the changes that we requested. I just want to, I want to thank everybody that's involved in the program and, um, and I also want to appreciate the changes too, because um, you know, I did also hear, and I heard from other listening sessions, not just here in Tualatin, but around town. And I do think that, um, you know, especially with, uh, especially with racial tensions in our community, there's some people that respond differently than others to police presence and um, being mindful and, understanding that um that some kids some kids experiences are going to be different than other kids experiences i think is really important when we're thinking about things and um and i thought those conversations with the other um council from tigard and the school board were informative to me there's just you know those couple things that come to mind are um are those those issues as well as just some different outcomes that our two schools experienced under the same program as far as um as far as convictions or exposure to the um actual legal system so those those were some things and i think that it's really important that the conversations happen because i didn't really understand that much about 
the SRO program. When I was growing up, we did not have police officers in my school. Um, kids being used to having police officers in the school is an interesting concept to me. And um, I do appreciate the thoughtfulness around the social worker and looking at especially addiction issues through the lens of a medical mo model and better understanding around that. And then I'm also curious around, um, especially with the GREAT program, how much gang involvement, and we have gangs here in Tualatin and I don't know anything about that. Um, yeah, I, I can answer that. The, 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 a lot of the training has to do with introduction. Uh, they, they do talk specifically in the grade training about the, you know, inf information about gangs and, uh, you know, how one is introduced to it and kind of the, uh, kind of the introduction to gangs, but a lot of it is familiarity with the SRO program. And, um, you know, it's, it's not all classroom. There's a lot of interactions that are fun. They, they do various activities during that week. Um, so it's not just all talking about gang activity. And, and it's, it's a lot about, about peer groups and just positive interactions with your peers and how to assimilate into middle school. Uh, it's a first, they do for sixth grade and then up on through eighth. So it's it's not all, I guess, a week of introduction or talking about gangs. It's a lot of it's a positive peer, peer, peer interaction and interaction with the police. So, um, and then as far as gangs in 12, I, I think they're, you know, I mean, We've had uh, gang incidents. I wouldn't say there's a, a gang issue in Walton by any stretch of imagination, but uh, I mean, it, 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 we're in the large metro area. You're going to be there's going to be you know, gang activity around, but not anywhere near uh, what I would call a problem or anything like that. Thanks for letting me know. I did work in community corrections for a while and worked with gang members, but I'd never heard of any here, so I was, I'm grateful to know that. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Chief or Sergeant Rankin? Okay. So do I have a motion? I have my hand on my ass. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Councilor Reyes. Oh, I also want to congratulate the team and the SROs. I did grow up in elementary, middle school, or junior high when I was going to school in high school when they're, you know, with SROs or police officers. So I am very familiar with it. Um, even in the 80s, um, when we were talking about just saying no, it was always a program done by the um, LAPD at the time. So um, I'm, I have to say that it's it's really tough. I, I, I think quality is doing great, and I really uh, encourage um, that connection with with the SROs and the, and the community because um, I did see violence in, inside my school, shootings and everything, and it was tough. It was, and uh, having someone, or at least knowing that there was present in my in my school, someone with some kind of, you know, support, uh, that was very, very helpful for those of us who were part of the neighborhood, but we weren't part of the gang. And I mean, I'm talking about gangs inside the school. Everyone was separated in groups. And there were times that they would just start fighting and there was this huge fight in the middle of the cafeteria. So I did grow up like that. I saw that all my life. Um, so I do have a lot of respect for the SROs. Um, when I did give a speech at the Tualatin um, and I believe it was an SRO or someone who works with the program. Uh, and I talked a little bit about my experience in, in high school um, and having been gunshot by a gang member, a rival gang member at 17, I was in the 11th grade. So I remember the kid went to my school. So I know all that. And um, one of the things that I, I kind of felt that there's there's maybe some kind of, a, I don't know, it's just, just, just an idea because I was a 17 year old in a really bad school. So. Um, it's that connection or volunteer opportunities to see what's beyond your school. And I think that um, like um, together go and feed the homeless or together like that activity that that is 
we're common, we're just, we're, we're, we're humans. And I think that was one of the things that I noticed that people want to do. And I, I remember that helped a lot, a, a bit with me growing up because I remember that um, Officer Beecham, and I remember his name, he coordinated the, the kids, the, the rough kids from my neighborhood, um, from our um, district to go and, and uh, go to a shelter and we fed uh, people. And we, and I felt so, and I'm telling you, I lived in the ghetto, but I felt privileged <laughs> because the way these people were living was way worse than when I, than I was living. So I felt like, wow, I, I value that moment, that time. And, and the fact that the officer was connecting with us, serving us well, that, that brought in a lot of I still remember it. And so, and I'm 40 something years old and I, I feel like that's, that was very helpful. And I think if we do more activities and we have nonprofits in the community here in Tualatin that we can, we can work with and, and kind of connect those young people that are in that stage of learning or wanting what to do. And it's not always academics because we all know that not everybody was made for school. Some of us are made with hands-on kind of work and exposing them to that kind of those kinds of activities activities and maybe connected with the SROs and the community leaders will be a great partnership to to help these individuals these kids that think of you know when I was in high school I never thought I was gonna finish high school. But then I graduated and I was like what do I do now? You know I was like I can't my you know <laughs> so it was it's just an eye opener and I'm just saying that it's just uh, ideas out there that we can connect with the youth and uh, the SROs and I, I really fully support your work but I think that working with nonprofits, local nonprofits will help a little bit more to connecting them bringing them in the community in the schools or I don't know and I don't know who can start that maybe you guys can but I I'm just saying that um, it helps a lot when you're in that age thank you any other comments Hillier. Yeah, I'd like to just um, say thank you to everyone who's made comment. And from some personal experience through my work life with the Tualatin Police Department and the school resource officers with Tualatin Together, who is a local nonprofit, like uh, Councilor Reyes was referring to, you know, we have had the opportunity to interact on, on so many different levels with so many different youth and um, the SROs have attended national conferences with the Community Anti-Drug um, Coalitions of America and helped our youth sitting at tables and mapping out our community and helping talk about logic models and doing the things that are happening. So I just really wanted to share some things that there are some really great things happening in our community. There are, um, <laughs> I mean, there are just so many different things, and um, I just wanted to ensure that people realize that those things are happening. And there is, a, you know, an addictions counselor at the high school that is separate, and there's a lip pro There are other programs at the high school that are separate, but the, the resources, um, I think the word resource is a little bit of an understatement to what these officers provide for most of our students. I, I appreciate Councilor Brooks's, um, you know, concerns and, and understand that. And I, I, so I'm excited to see what the new messaging will look like and the partnerships that um, we can even continue if we continue the TMAC program, which is um, something that Twelton Together is working um, with some huge HIDA groups and different things. So anyway, I just wanted to ensure everyone that's here that so many great things are happening and um, we, we appreciate partnerships as, as a nonprofit in the community. Well, may you make a motion? All right. A motion to adopt resolution number 5538-21. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution number 5538-21. Any discussion on the motions? Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Councilor Pratt. Aye. Councilor Brooks. Aye. Councilor Reyes. Yes. Councilor President Grimes. Aye. 
I vote aye. Also, the resolution is adopted unanimously. Uh, item number two, consideration of resolution number 5540-21, setting a parks utility fee. Uh, there's Ross. <laughs> Pop it up. Good evening, Hello. Ross. Hello, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilors. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm. we are joined by uh, Rich Mueller. And uh, Rich Mueller, uh, just take a second to recognize Rich Mueller uh, through this conversation about park utility and, and asset management of the, of the assets in our parks. Rich Mueller uh, did the heavy lifting. Without, without Rich and his hard work, we wouldn't uh, be having this conversation tonight. So thank you, Rich. Really appreciate that. Um, so you, you uh, might recall December, uh, Council adopted Ordinance 1447-20. Uh, that was authorizing the parks utility uh, in creating it through Municipal Code 3-7. And then uh, at our most recent meeting, April 12th uh, work session, uh, Council discussed the fee and directed staff to bring back a resolution setting the parks utility fee at $5 per month beginning Jan July 1st, 2021. Uh, so we have uh, returned with that resolution for your consideration, discussion and consideration. Thank you. So with that, discussion and consideration by City Council. If there's no discussion, oh. Council Hillier. Uh, yes, um, I just, um, I didn't weigh in before because I really had to think even more about this. And I really um, am passionate about our parks, but I really think that as a community, as a council, as stewards of the resources in our community, I am concerned that we don't seem to have a solid um, plan for maintenance. And so um, I, I just want to put that out there. I, I understand where this discussion is going and, and it's the right thing, but I am very concerned that we are in a position of $9.6 million in deferred costs of maintenance. And, and I really think that um, my conscience really says to me, we need to make sure that we have some standards in place to move that forward other, and I know that we're gonna work on braided funding and the, all those sorts of things, but I am really concerned that um, there isn't a plan and I would be willing to help be part of a solution to that, but I just really could not um, let this opportunity go by without saying that. Thank you. Thank you. I move to adopt resolution 55402. Your, oh. your hand like walks into your doorway. Yeah, you? you're. <laughs> into what? Your hand's hard to see because it's going on uh, your, your closet much better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you do this. <laughs> Go ahead, Councilor Reyes. Um, I'm not sure I love our parks and I sit on a committee where I hear what the community has to say um, about the parks and I, I'm actually not, no, 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 I can't, I can't really move and, and forward with a $5 fee. That, that really, I just think of a lot of families that I come across and talk to all the time and a $5 fee seems seems a lot to me. I, I think I want to reconsider that. I'm just, um, if I, I, I want to be on, I, I'm not, I feel like I'm in favor of the parks. I want to do this, but um, I think $5 for me is, we just went for the top and I feel like there's, there's no consideration of uh, maybe trying like $4 or $3 maybe for the next two years kind of go up a little bit, stay at five, see what things look like with COVID. I mean, we're closing restaurants or we're thinking of closing in the next couple of weeks. And um, I just don't feel comfortable um, with the $5 fee. Um, I do really want to work hard and I'm willing to 
put on my tennis shoes and my athletic clothes and go out there and knock on every single door for months if I have to and get everyone to jump on board with something that's going to really make a difference with like a bond or something that's going to be, that's going to change and, and be um, transformational. Um, so I wanted to say that I, I can't, I don't know, I just felt like it was, it was easy to say five dollars, and I don't know. I can't. I, I just can't fathom that in our families that are out there. Um, and I just want to say that I'm not. I, I would. I really want to consider if, uh, thinking um, something. I don't know between three, maybe three or four, or something like that. But I can't. That's her Pratt. I guess you know where I'm going to be coming from. Um, well, I agree with um, Councillor Hillier. Um, I mean, this is a drop in the bucket of what we need, but we um, we're we have so much deferred maintenance, and and yes, may, uh, I mean, hopefully we're going to get a bond or a levy in the future. But right now, we need to do something. We have we have things closed because we don't. There's been deferred maintenance for decades, and and if we don't do this, we're just going to have more and more deferred maintenance and less parks. And I, I mean, we've all seen during this COVID time that people have just, um, our parks have been packed. If you go out there on a nice day and they've been packed and even our river was packed this year. And so, um, and really if we're, if we're gonna sit here and quibble about three or $5, we're talking about $24 a year and people that live in apartments aren't paying this. Other people, there, um, I know Council Brooks could speak to this, but there are, um, there's help out there for them. So um, I, I just really feel we need to um, do this with the full five dollars. Then I want to see it like in writing or something that there's a there's a plan uh, if this something if 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 um, we go into a bond or a levy. I mean, we had a survey and and. People were just, I don't know, this is pre-COVID and people were against it. So I, don't, I can't even imagine how things are gonna be now with COVID. So I I wanna see something that's gonna show me a plan. I, I see, you can just say $5 and then okay, be, so be it. I, I wanna see a plan that says, okay, for this amount, this is going, this is gonna happen for this year. Then next year we're gonna do this and then the following year is gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen. And that's what I, I have not seen that yet. I just I just see a fee. That's all I'm seeing right now. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I I understand everybody's concerns and um, I appreciate everybody's comments. Um, and I look at all this deferred maintenance too and um, you know, how did it get how did it get this bad? But I would also like to remind people that we've been working on the master plan and been working on this funding for years now. And I can personally say that I've worked on this for years being part of T-Park. So the, the longer we wait, the more deferred maintenance we're gonna have. And, um, and I do think that, you know, I, I do understand that, you know, the difference between four and $5 a year is, is $12 and I think, I think that, that that's, that's a, small a small price, price to pay for the value our parks brings, bring to the community. I mean, it's that's less than going to a movie one time where you can use the parks again and again and again and again. Um, so I think it's it's money well spent. And to Valerie's point, um, you know, there is you know people in apartments aren't necessarily paying that directly. There's programs. Um, and this is part of the solution too, but it's a part of the solution that we can have an impact for right now. Um, and we can start making a dent right now. And I'd also like to remind folks that we can get grants and matching dollars. So with these funds, it's not just these funds, we can think of them as possibly times two. Um, with with matching grants if if we are able to get those so it can be a bigger impact um but again uh, it, it's something that 
is, is an urgent need, as Cindy Councilor Hillier pointed out, $9 million. Um, and so I really think we need to start chipping away at this as, as soon as possible. Um, so I'm hoping that we could pass it at the at the five dollars. Again, the difference between four and five is twelve dollars for a year. Um, so yeah, thank you. Again, I, that was all pre-COVID. Let me finish my point. I will not speak after this. I was it was pre-COVID. Everything we planned, we all have made adjustments after COVID. We all have changed things around. There's a, a lot coming. I mean, we're still there's. People are closing businesses pretty soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, and we all had to adjust our lifestyle in every single way. And um, even with, even theaters are gonna be closed. So it's not just thinking of like going to the movies or anything. Um, I just think that it's, I don't think it's the, I wanna see it in writing, how this is gonna play out and how things are gonna look like. Otherwise, it's just, um, I want to see it in writing. I want to see how things are going to be planned out. And then by maybe next year or two years from now, we're going to do a bond and something like that. But I have not seen that. So I've only heard fees. That's all I'm hearing. Uh, so Councilor Hillier, then Councilor Brooks. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I guess my um, only other statement is um, I um, I, I hear this and I am um, in favor of the $5, but I, with that, believe that this will be a very unpopular statement, but I do think we need to consider a moratorium on new building that comes out of this particular pot of money, other than the SDCs. I think we need to decide to commit, and, and that's just my opinion, to commit to putting our capital right now that, that, that is not restricted funds into um, getting these parks back to safe and healthy. And it, it, it's part of the, you know, why people move here to Tualatin. These, these parks are critical to us. And, and, I, and I understand that. I just am, um, that's, that's all, sorry. Council Brooks, then Council Pratt, then Council Saka. Well, I, um, I'm not gonna speak long. I want to just say from my understanding when we move on to the bond conversation that's when capital um, focus would be and I um, appreciate Councilor Reyes's concerns um, about um, having a plan and I think that I'm really encouraged that about Sherilyn's suggestion around utilizing the same um, group that did our um, moving forward bond work. So that to me feels like we will have a plan and that is a capital projects conversation and I'm looking forward to making progress on that as well. In the meantime, I wanna remind people that the parks disproportionately serve people that don't have yards, kids, a place for them to go play. It's been an amazing resource for everybody during COVID. And finally, it affects every single person's property values that owns homes. So to me, um, I'm kind of with Councilor Sacco. I've been talking about this since I came on to council. Um, I'm kind of surprised we're having a long debate after we gave really specific direction. And um, I mean, I'm ready to make a motion. So I'd, I'd like, like to move to that we- um, Yeah, wait, Bridget, you got two more questions before. Oh. oh. Councilor Pratt and Sacco have to go. I'm ready, everybody else is ready. Councilor Brooks covered most of what I was gonna say. The only thing, um, um, I'm kind of, um, I just wanna say that I felt like um, last time and many times before we've seen um, how these fees will be used to help repair our park. So I think that's already been covered. Mr. Saka? Sorry, and real quick, I just wanted to, um, I meant to say this earlier, but when we did the cert, when we did the community survey, it wasn't that people didn't support it. It was over 50% of people that supported um, some sort of fee bond levy, but it wasn't 
it wasn't over the top support, but it was over, I, and I can't remember the percentage now, but it was over 50% that, um, that did support funding our parks. It just wasn't um, way over the top. So I feel um, that, that it is the majority of our community that supports funding our parks um, from that community survey that was done. Thank you. Now back to Council Brooks. Okay, I move to um, to for consideration of resolution five five four zero two one um, to approve uh, setting up parks utility fee. Second. I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution five five four zero dash two one setting up parks utility fee. Councilor Hillier. Aye. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Council Pratt. Aye. Council Brooks. Aye. Council Reyes. No. Council President Grimes. Aye. And the chair votes aye also. So it's a six to one in favor of resolution 5540-21. The resolution is adopted. All right. Uh, moving to items removed from that. Blah, blah, blah. Items removed from consent. We did have one item removed from consent, and that is item number three, consideration of approval of a change in liquor license application for, for Buffalo Wild Wings. And that was pulled by Councilor Hilliard. So all, I appreciate that it is late. And I just wanted to point out, I, and I also will um, put Sean at rest to uh, understand that I appreciate that this body has absolutely no authority other if this goes through or not. But I really want to point out, um, as I look at OAR 845-006-0399, and it's a rule um, that has been um, instated by the governor uh, on March 8th of 2020 and an extension um, until she decides to change that extension, which is a temporary rule to allow offsite um, uh, uh, drinks. Now I'm forgetting the right words. But anyway, I just really feel like it's important for this um, body to understand that, to know that um, if you take a look at that, um, and I hope that we do in the future, if you take a look at that, whatever this is, ordinance, temporary rule, sorry, um, I should know, um, that a full on-site um, premises sales license um, um, carries, carries with it violations. I'd like to have some understanding. And again, I appreciate somewhat that this is rhetorical, but I do think it's important for this body to understand that it's a change in accessibility of alcohol in our community and that um, there is a training uh, issue, there is a, comp not issue, there is a training component and a compliance component that is not addressed in the state standards. And um, there is a lot of discussion that this will likely be moved into a permanent offsite premises um, uh, ruling. And um, there are really no, um, there's no ability to track um, who is getting it, that there are for, formal um, IDs and things like that. So I just really wanted to make this body aware that this is something that um, groups across the state um, and um, that are looking at. And I feel like it's important that we consider what we want our community to look like. And it could be instead of a $75 fee, for instance, that we jack the fee up to change um, this particular because it's a it's an uh, um, amendment to their liquor their current liquor license because you have to have an on-site license in order to do this and so um, anyway I just um, wanted to bring that to this body's attention before we vote on it thank you any other questions or comments So I have a motion to uh, approve the change in liquor license application for Buffalo Wild Wings. So moved. Sorry, I- Cuts are red. I don't think I'm understanding the, um, so, uh, so what 
cancer uh, in the Tyler, the other, sorry, uh, red. I, I think I need a little bit more explanation of what um, what's going on with, with uh, it's, a, it's Buffalo Wild Wings. So, I mean, are you saying that they, they're not allowed to serve liquor or outside of their premises or uh, they are allowed to serve, but under these conditions that we are right now with COVID? I guess I'm not understanding. Do you want to weigh in, Sean, or? In easier terms, please. Thank you. Do you want to weigh in, Sean, or Chief Steele? I think it's maybe a Sean question. Yeah, either way. Uh, so so the governor, and, and uh, through administrative rule, is allowed for drinks to go. And so certain establishments who have the proper liquor license can now sell uh, drinks to go. So you, have, you still have to be of age. You still have to, it's, it's not uh, allowed to be served to minors, but it allows somebody who is over the, uh, 21 or over to go in uh, and purchase liquor to go. Well, and to, re and to add to that, it also allows for third party like Grubhub or those sorts of organizations to have a person who is 18 years of age or older be the person that is responsible for checking the ID when they get there, for ensuring that they're not intoxicated before they hand it over. There are a lot of stipulations in this that again, we as a body can cannot change. This is what it is. But I just thought that we should understand that that is happening. And, and Buffalo Wild Wings is not the first um, uh, restaurant in our community to do this. It's just the first since I've been on council and had the opportunity to weigh in. Oh, understood. Okay, so, okay. I, I'm sorry, I understand now. So. You're just bringing it up to our attention. Okay, thank you. Do I have a motion? I, I, I move to, sorry, I'm lost on the thing. I move to uh, approve the item three from the, um, from the, uh, Consent agenda. consent agenda for the change in the liquor rule for Buffalo Wild Wings. Okay. I'll second that. Okay. So I have a motion and a second for approving the change in liquor license application for Buffalo Wild Wings in discussion on the motion. Councilor Hillier. Mention. Uh, Councilor Pratt. Aye. Council Brooks. Aye. Council Reyes. Yes. Councilor Sacco. Aye. Council Grimes. Aye. And I vote I also. So we have six ayes and one abstention. All right. So the liquor licenses change is approved. Moving down, uh, any communications from council? Councilor Pratt. I believe we have a development commission meeting right after this, and I just wonder if yeah. my buddy of that. Yep. All right. So with that, do I have a motion for adjournment of the city council meeting? So moved. All those of, all those in favor of adjourning the city council meeting for this evening, put your hands up. Say aye. Aye. All right. This meeting is now concluded. Now we switch gears and I'll open up the uh, call to order the April 26th, 2021 Tualatin Development Commission meeting. Uh, first item on the agenda is public comment. This is uh, an opportunity for those who would like to speak to something that is not on the commission's agenda tonight. Please limit your comments to three minutes. Do we have anyone uh, Bates at the poll center in the meeting, the slim pickings in the meeting that uh, wants to give public comment to the commission. There is no one here at the poll center. All right. public so our next item up is our consent agenda. Our consent agenda is passed with one vote. Uh, these are things that are considered routine and we vote 
on these items as a group uh unless someone would like the item remove consent does anyone like one items one or two removed from the consent agenda tonight no nope. all right so our items tonight consist of item number one consideration of approval of the small development commission meeting minutes on uh, march 22nd 2021 and item number two is consideration of resolution number 626-21 approving the annual financial report for fiscal year 2019-2020. I move to adopt the consent agenda as read. Second. I have a motion and second to approve the consent agenda as read. Uh, Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. All right, Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. The chair votes aye also. Uh, item number three, uh, item number one in general business is consideration of resolution number 625-21, five, that's 625-21, authorizing the administrator to execute a sole source contract with the Lane Howard Consulting LLC. And I see Jonathan's back. Yeah. So real quick, Commission, this is just a simple contract to do the Leventon substantial amendment. At a later date, the reason why we are doing this is we're going to uh, be crafting an intergovernmental agreement with the city of Tualatin. So we won't have to be back in this kind of capacity again. So per Sean, we're cleaning up our our ordinances and our contracts. But for tonight, this is just a simple sole source contract to do the substantial amendment for level. Any questions for Jonathan? I'll make a motion to adopt resolution number 625-21. Second. I have a motion and second to adopt resolution 625-21. Any discussion on those motions? All right, Commissioner Hillier. Aye. Commissioner Pratt. Aye. Commissioner Brooks. Aye. Commissioner Reyes. Yes. Commissioner Sacco. Aye. Commissioner Grimes. Aye. And the chair votes aye also. The resolution is adopted. Uh, and that's it. Do I have a motion for adjournment for tonight? So moved. <laughs> I have a motion and a second to close the commission meeting for this evening. All those in favor say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. Thank aye. you all. Have a safe night. And for anybody who's still listening, again, continue to wear your mask and stay socially distant and wash your hands. <laughs>